Hello and welcome to a Burkamp Wonderland and Arsenal podcast. I'm Guna Gimli and tonight my guests are... First up, he's the cheddar munching, hairy ladies' favourite. It's Danny the GFP. Hello, Danny. Ahoy, ahoy, shit, mate. And what kind of week have you had? I've been up all day. I've been up since one. Shit the I've, bed again? I've, yeah, I know, it's disgraceful. I was, I've was i been trying to pronounce foreign names properly and then I listened to the Tuesday Club and what they said about Black Friday and I think other people need to point their hate somewhere else. I, I heard they were called the Tuesday Club. <laughs> they were, I'll tell you what, they go, like our Jeff was saying, they're very near the knuckle. I think we've got nothing to worry about. They'll be shut down before we are. So forget about that comment. It's all banter. It, it's uh, uh, piss taking, I call it. Banter as if you're a teenager. Exactly. Next up, it's the Don Daddy himself, Jeff Arsenal. Hello, Jeff. Gimli, how are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm very good. Very good. Uh, uh, what kind of a week have you had? All right, you know me. I'm firefighting, mate. Ducking and, got, ducking and diving. The ducking and diving. Moving and a shaking, as they do. That's the one, but not in a Spaniard. No, definitely not, mate. Not at a minute. <laughs> That's probably a few weeks away for you, isn't it? Sunny Fulham at the minute, mate. Freezing me cods off. Oh, God, what a life you lead. Oh, no. Right, next up, old friend of the show, and back to help us out, it's ex-Arsenal midfield man, Dave Hillier. Hello, Dave. Hello, chaps. Nice to chat to you all again. You, you, your, your warm, loving voice is like a comfort blanket to our show. Why, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's lovely, isn't it? We'll move on. Did, um, did Danny say you was a hoy shit mate? <laughs> yes, I think he did. He does it every week. <laughs> You're a shit mate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, nice, nice to speak to you, mate. And you. Uh, and finally, contrary to popular belief, this man is neither American nor a politician. It's Arsenal man, Jimmy Carter. Hello, Jimmy. Fellas, how are we doing? <laughs> See, he pops onto the stage. He's, he's, like, <laughs> a, he's, like, he's <laughs> like an olden times Jimmy Bullard. Oh, Jim... I'm, I'm excited. I, I, I love the way you, you, you describe Hills' voice as like mellow and all. He's the oval team of podcasts, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not when I sing Let It Be, though, Jim, in India. On oh, <laughs> Hills. Hey, we've got, hey, we've got to have a sing song tonight, haven't we? We have to. Well, little bit. Let's see if we can squeeze one in, boys. Little, yeah. little, little karaoke tonight. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Right then. <laughs> Lo- lovely, lovely to be involved. Thank you for inviting me, and thanks everyone for listening tonight. I'm really excited about being on with you, boys. And uh, yeah, let's have a little uh, good conversation, and then uh, yeah. Looking forward to getting involved. I must just say that Jimmy is criminally underfollowed. On Twitter, he has 352 (laughs) followers. Jeff, we need to do something about that, don't we? We'll have to to sort that out, mate. We'll have a whip round or something, won't we? That's it. Well, that's what we'll do. We'll be up to a million before the week's out. We'll have to see um, if we can't ring up, oh, what's his name, Funky Chris, and see where he got all of his followers from. (laughs) See if we and, can't buy a few. And Jimmy is actually an uh, Arsenal fan, because most people know that he played for Liverpool and Millwall and uh, is it Chelsea as well, wasn't he? No, it wasn't Chelsea, uh, Portsmouth. Uh, Portsmouth, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, after, and it was blue. After Arsenal, it was Portsmouth, yeah. Yeah, so people forget that he's actually, you're, a, you're an Arsenal fan, aren't you? Grew up an Arsenal fan, yeah. Lived uh, in Stoke Newington, literally about 10 minutes away from Highbury. Uh, actual fact, went to Drayton Park School, which is literally a stone's throw from the Emirates where it is right now. Represented is in school boys as a, as a as a little kid. Uh, got along to Highbury, like I say, uh, in the the late seventies, watching the likes of Liam Brady, Malcolm McDonald, um, so, uh, Sammy Nelson, Pat Rice, Willie Young at the back, all them boys, and just dreamt. Willie. Yeah, just dreamt of one day, dreaming of one day pulling the shirt on just once was would be a, would have been a dream. So used to go to the school boys enclosure, just left at the North Bank, and just dream and just look at the boys and. Uh, just wonder w- what it would be like to maybe pull that red and white shirt on, which that, was uh, which was brilliant. And that happened the eighth of December, nineteen ninety one, away at Nottingham Forest. We lost three two, but it weren't your fault. Yeah, and no, oh, it probably was. I probably was uh, fought for two of the goals. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember, I remember coming on sub. I think Anders come off that, that day. We were, we were getting beat, and um, yeah, you did. You come on for him. Come on for Anders, and uh, yeah, it was unfortunate that we got beat that day. But, um, but yeah, Hillier, Hillier played the whole game, I so I blame him. I was going to say I remember playing that game. No, you don't. I, do, I remember pinging a ball to Lee Dixon, forty yards across the pit. <laughs> <laughs> right, I love it. It was four inches off, the, <laughs> skimming the top of the grass. Oh, I love can it. picture it in my mind's eye beautifully, and then the rest of the game played shit. <laughs> no, I, 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 I did all right. I don't think we deserved to lose that game. I think it was one of them games when I was tasked to chase Roy. Roy Keane up and down, and then give the ball to um, the the aforementioned Jimmy Carter to do something at the other end. 
That was pretty much my role back then. But um, yeah, you done your yeah, job. Actually, Dan, that's one I do remember, mate. Oh, glorious! Only um, was... I, 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 how times flown though, Hills, eh? That's, that's I, I, just about twenty odd, twenty odd years ago, isn't it? I think after that game, I went out in Nottingham, in Nottingham with Kevin and a few of the lads from from Forest. Roy Keane was there. He borrowed my Gucci loafers and he never gave them back. The bust. That's why he's so angry. They probably yeah, didn't fit. He had trainers on, didn't he? Oh. He, must probably, he must probably sold them when he got back. Yeah, I'm not going to use the P word. But he has <laughs> what a prick. It's, it's, I'll do it's, it for it's, you. It's, <laughs> one of, it's one of them, though, with Roy Keane. You'd go, you know what? You, you can have them. It's not a problem. <laughs> 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 They're yours, mate. They're, They're yours. yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Happy yeah. Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. In, fact, in fact, they look better on you than they do me. It's one of them, isn't it? I feel, first of all, we must start off by uh, apologising, because as always, we sold you the dream tonight, um, and unfortunately, Anders Lempar can't make it. Danny, why can't he make it? Um, Frederick Darnell, our man in Sweden, has said there has been a, a DDOS, which is a denial of operation services or something, on a, one of the major um, internet and mobile. And, you know, like in the UK, you have Sky, where they have, you get your TV, your broadband, your internet, your mobile phone. One of those has been down for the last day or so, and they reckon that um, and Anders could be on that because he gave us his mobile number. Yeah. And uh, he's, he, he's not been used. He's not been tweeting for the last day or two. So we reckon that's what it is because uh, he's been a very, very friendly bloke. So there's no way that he we twisted his arm and made him come on. So I think he'll be back one day. Yeah, hopefully so. We'll uh, we'll do what we're doing tonight and Anders at some point in the new year. Yeah. Uh, touch wood, Danny. I know you will. I am. Um, We'll start off as ever then with a roundup of all things Arsenal. Danny, you've got the scores and uh, have you got a brief report on the Pirates? I certainly have. I'll get through this as quick as possible. Galatasaray under 19s 1, Arsenal under 19s 3. I'm not going to tell you the scores, you know, political reasons. Um, we uh, finish runners up in that group for through to the next stage. Aston Villa under 18 1, Arsenal under 18 1. Again, I'm not telling you the goal scores because we don't need the grief. And so the under 21s are second in the league behind Newcastle, and the under 18s are eighth. Now then, you ready for a bit of stunning Barbican Pirates information? We um, we sponsor their shirts, in case you're wondering, Jimmy. It's a fucking so, typo. So we we uh, we feel obliged, and Chris is uh, is one of our pod members, and he's their player manager. He's the the best right back in the world. He's right up there with um, Cafu between him and Cafu for the best right back ever. What, Cafu now? <laughs> That's it, he said, right. The Pirates went, This Chris wrote this, the manager, so it's going to be pretty good. He said, the Pirates went into Saturday's game versus Tam- Tamar View, confident of a win, and it was a conf- confidence richly rewarded. Oh, God, I'm fucking it up already. Sporting their green ABW away shirts, the Pirates were quickly in front. Centre-back Nick Errington headed the opener on six minutes from man of the match Greg Davis' corner. Tamar View equalised in the 21st minute from a corner, but it was only a temporary blip. Young striker Callum Knight fired in on 34 minutes. Nick Errington got a second header to make it 3-1 at half-time. The second half was all Pirates. Callum Knight took over scoring on the 52nd, 54th, 64th and 83rd minutes. His fourth of his career and the best five goals came in as a spectacular Rabona flick from 12 yards. A memorable day for the manager's par- Carpenters, managed Carpenters Pirates. Final score, Barbican Pirates 7, Tamar View 2. I and bet he says, was stood on the sidelines with a Rabona. <laughs> <laughs> he says, uh, this weekend is a tough-looking clash away to table toppers, Revel Stoke Rangers. Come on, ye pirates. But that young bloke, Callum Knight, is, I think he said he's got 14 goals in nine games. So he's amazing. I, I think it's he's ridiculous. Own... Absolutely he's... ridiculous. Why can't they just go back to losing again? It's no fun when they win. No, but they're on, they are on one. That player is one hell of a player. He reckons he's good enough to play in at least League 2, maybe League 1. What they, what they played, like, eight, one, two... No, lost lost. the rest of them <laughs> I think they've only won one in the league but they are only two years old as a team and Raj has actually put up £200 yeah. for the cause if they avoid relegation well I think Raj mate your money's safe <laughs> um, <laughs> our first match for debate is Arsenal's 3-2 loss on Saturday to Stoke City um, Jess, Jeff if you can give us a brief rundown of this one please Oh, it was bleak, wasn't it? The first 45 minutes was just... Well, you know, if you go to Stoke, well, if you, there's a lot of teams in the Premier League that you've got to go and you've got to be at it straight away. Stoke is definitely one of them teams. We've got we've got history up there. 
Uh, you know, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of hatred in the in the with the, with the Stoke supporters. Obviously, what's gone on in the past, and within so many seconds, we was one nil down. A long ball, typical Stoke out to the right hand side. Gibbo never got close enough. Ball was whipped in. I don't know what happened with with regards to Chambers and and Bellerin. They just got in a bit of a muddle. Bump. It's, it's a one nil. We we then went up the field. We should have scored. With with uh, Oliver Giroud had a fantastic chance. He's he's got to score them. You know the, the little chance he had. And then before you know it, 35 minutes again down the right hand side. Didn't get close enough. Ball was knocked in. Murtasaka's all over the place pushed about all over the place and uh, Bojan Krezic comes in and slotted a, a nice goal in. 3-0 down on 45 minutes. We're going at half-time. Uh, whatever was said at half-time, I mean, because the game's over at that stage. Uh, we got into the second half, started playing our football, you know, um, got back into the game. But unfortunately, we, we, we peed the wagon after um, Callum Chambers got sent off, which I think was really, really harsh. Now, you know, it's really, really difficult, but you can't start games, you know, and go 3-0. You can't, you can't give three goals away in the first. It reminded me of Chelsea and Liverpool, um, you know, last season. I don't, know, I don't know what you think, David, about the situation. What do you reckon? Well, I don't know. I, 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 would, I didn't actually see the game, so I saw, I saw highlights, but I, would, I was trying to keep up with it um, via text commentary. And... It's a difficult one for me. You're playing against the manager, like you said, who's got a bit of history with Arsenal about getting results, and particularly, you know, while he's with Stoke, Hughes, he's done. He know he's got like a little game plan. He gets the players in the right mindset, so he gets them in the right mental frame. But when when you compare it with like the Liverpool's and the Chelsea thrashings we took, mate, it's Stoke City. We should be going out there, going from. We shouldn't be going out there with nothing other than. You know the, the attitude that we're going to win the game, regardless of our history there, and I, I just can't put my finger on it. Why they just for 45 minutes played like they was, you know, within themselves, didn't want to come out, was was frightened. Obviously, going down that early to such a crap goal, such crap defending, um, had an effect. But we haven't actually seen that um, that happen to the team this year. In fairness to them, when they've gone down early in any games or or gone down against the run of the play, we haven't seen that that look on their faces. What do we do now? And that's what we saw again against Stoke. And you know, and it took the half-time break. Obviously, words have been said. I'm, I'm no doubt about that. They won't they won't stand for that. And you know, too little, too late. Second half. But like it's you know, it's a it's a game of chances. Like you said, you take you take your chance at one nil or two one and get back at two nil or get back into it. It's a whole different game. You've only got to look back to the FA Cup final. You know, we went down a few goals, but because we got our one back early enough, the confidence was there. We built on it. There just weren't enough time in the game. And as far as just to finish up, as far as Callum Chambers goes, I don't know, Jeff. I think he he's got to get that out of his game. He puts his hands on a lot of people when he's trying to recover um, because he likes to nick the ball in front. He's got to find the right balance of when to nick the ball in front and when to sit a yard behind and let them have it. You know, um, and referees will get to know that about you. They'll say he puts his hands on people, he pulls you back. So you'll get a card straight away. Yeah. Um, and Jimmy, we'll go over to you now. 3-0 by half time. Um, a lot has been said about the manager's performance. Is this one down to the manager? Is this one purely down to the players? Um, what's your take on it? It's got to be down to the players. Uh, 100% because as Hill says, I mean, I didn't actually see the game myself. Again, I was one that saw the highlights. But... Um, what one thing you you know you know what you're going to get at Stoke. I mean, Hills Hills will tell you. You know, you go to them sort of places. There's away grounds where you just know you're going to be under the cosh for for large periods of the game. They're going to punt the ball forward. They're very direct. Stoke are one of them teams. You, you know, Arsenal know what they're going to get. To concede in the first minute uh, in the way they did was 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 tragic. To be fair, and the the, the second goal was absolutely shocking. You know, the fellas run. I think Flamini's let him run run. Uh, Mertesacker has not even thought, thought about uh, picking him up, and um, you're two 0 down. I mean, you can't you can't start the game as Hill said. You can't start the game and, and try and come back at two you know at two nil. Um, you know we had a decent chance as, as Hill said again with with Giroud, but um, three 0 down at half time. And it, to be fair, it could have been four, couldn't it? I mean, it was the fourth one was swiped off, but um, the lads have got to be more up for it and and, and be up for the task and be just be more resilient. But Jim, right. don't. Uh... Don't you think it's it, like when we played, 
there was there was a mental response at one nil. If 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 personally I was playing for yeah. the Arsenal and we went one nil down after two minutes, I would be thinking that's shit. But we've got eighty eight minutes to turn this around, and I'd start thinking in that third minute, this is the start of my eighty eight minutes. The game starts now, yeah. and. When we went one nil down, it was like, oh shit, what do we do? And before you know it, then you're two, and there's there's no one to turn to. No people were looking at each other, saying, "Who's going to get us out of this?" We had characters in our team who wouldn't allow us to even get to that stage. At one nil, Definitely. if anyone's head was dropping with eighty eight minutes to go, oh. you should be on the pitch. You, oh. you, you got eighty eight minutes to win that game. Yeah, and and if you if anyone like the management, George Graham saw your head go down, you know, yeah. in, 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 you'd be dragged off. You'd get the fish yeah, hook straight away. Know. It would, it would have it. With regard to that, don't you think, I mean, we had a young defence, Bellerin, Chambers, and obviously Gibbo. Gibbo's got a bit of experience, but Chambers and Bellerin, obviously no experience really in the, in the Premier League. Shouldn't you be looking at a man like Per Mertesacker with, with 100 Germany caps to, to you know, give a little bit of help to, the, to these youngsters? Because that first 45 minutes he had an appalling game, he was, he was just all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, I, 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 go on, go on. yeah, I think Jeff, uh, as a young player, there's it's either sort of fight or flight, isn't it? You're either going to roll your sleeves up and get on with it. At the end of the day, they had Crouch and Waters up front. Do you know what I mean? If I was a young lad going out against them, I'd be thinking, these are the kind of games I want to start. I want to start my Arsenal career out on. Yeah. I don't really want to start with Eden Hazard, my, you know, playing playing against him or Costa. I've got a chance of playing against these two. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna work really hard, get tight. This is an opportunity for me. Um, then you know, no disrespect to them as players, but it's, they're not the best players these kids are going to come up against. Mm. Whereas I think when when them players done something well, and our players didn't, the, just the reaction again was uh, a little bit of doubt, a little bit of self doubt. Can I compete against these? And before you know it, two 0 down, and then other players ain't helping you out around the pitch. You know, your midfielder looking at the defence saying, "You've got us into this shit. We're two 0 down." And players start pointing the finger. You don't want that in the first 20 minutes of the game. You, you've got you've got a job to do. You've got some goals to get back. And it weren't until I think we had that half-time talk that they they sort of re- came together again. You know, sort of got all their got all their sort of probably problems out at half-time. Got their game back on second half, but it's, it's too late even against teams like Stoke. Mm. And uh, Danny, behind after 20 seconds is pretty embarrassing. I mean, are the fans right to be angry with that performance? Um, I, I only saw the highlights because I thought I'm not going to bother getting out of bed for this because I've just become I hate football now, and so I saw the highlights and I thought it was a bit unlucky. It, it's goals like that happen all the time. It's just unlucky that it happened. I think I've heard of anywhere from 16th to the 21st second, but I'm just surprised that looking at the bench, you had young um, A J A Y I. Easy, easy. Yeah, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it. And young Maitland Niles, who wears number seventy, which is a good year to be born. Um, so, and, but you don't have people like Rosicky on the bench, who, when you when you're playing a tough away game against a team that are, that are known to be, uh, they're not they're not scared of a tackle, are they? But then you're looking at um, uh, the results and the, uh, the the ratings for our players. It was most of our back five. They're all rubbish on the day. The rest of them, like Flamini, got seven seven. Ramsey seven six. Sanchez seven seven. Kfola eight one. The Ox got seven point three. So I think the problem is just with the back five. But then you think of our the Arsenal back five, and then out of that back five, you had one um, one of them playing, which is Murtasaka. So you're going away, and you change. I mean, you didn't have to have Martinez in goal, and you could have played um, and put in Bella in a, a game where you know it's going to be a tough game against a tough crowd. I think maybe some of the choices that that Wenger did maybe weren't in hindsight the best choices it, it probably would have been better for the team to have played um, Chesney in goal a little bit of more stability and then play Chambers at right back and then I don't know maybe play um, I mean Shelney was on the bench but to go there we should have gone all out defensive and trying and gone for the point because it's like, that's like babysitting everybody though Dan you saying oh I can't I can't play in there today because it's going to be a tough game for him oh. we never had that luxury did we Jim you're playing at Leeds no. tonight Dave Jim they're going to be on you from the before you even go out and look check the pitch whether you'll get a stud or a mould. They're going to be throwing things at you, booing you, and shouting at you. It's going to be wet, cold, and muddy. There you go, get on with it, son. I don't. Think... That, that, is, that is hostile, Gaff Leeds. Don't worry about. Don't worry <laughs> yeah. about Stoke. They're just oh, talking about Stoke. I mean, what they're going to do? You know, oh. take little pots and give them to you, and I don't know. I don't, what do they do up there? Modern it's footballers, Stoke. though, in it. They're all all lightweights, most of them. But I just think now. I just think you know, players. You're talking. They ain't young players. They're 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 twenty year old people. You know, they've been in the game 
prof- been, been brought up professionally for a lot longer than people like me and Jimmy had. We got remember we started at twelve thirteen, and we didn't get in a professional game till sort of fourteen when we signed schoolboys. These people, these kids, have been groomed through from eight all the way up. They know how to. They should know how to react and behave, and you know to look 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 to big games and be able to perform and debuts and you know you know go into hostile places. That should be part of bread and butter for them. You know, yeah. that's just an excuse for me. It, at the end of the day, it's Stoke on a pitch that's the same size every week. We need to beat them. And we need to have a, a better reaction when things don't go right. And we've showed that for a lot of the season because we haven't had the greatest season, but we've got results in a yeah. lot of games. We've got a lot of 90-minute goals, you know, goal, winning games or drawing in the, in the last 10 minutes. We've got a lot. And that's, that shows character. And then you go down after after 20 seconds and all of a sudden it's... You know, Ed's in your knees time. No, I ain't buying, buying that. Wherever that young you are, it's Stoke. It ain't Chelsea. Yeah, that's true. It's Stoke. But it's a bit sad that in um, in the modern game, Flamini is seen as a hard man in the modern game, when in your days he'd have been seen as a lightweight, dodgy foreigner and put on his ass. Yeah, like Anders. <laughs> <laughs> he was too quick to be caught. No, I, no, I, I, I don't think... Um, yeah, I, I'm not talking about sort of that that side of thing. I think Flamini would have been back then he'd have been the same player he is now. You know, yeah. that's that's, yeah. that's the guy. I just think the way that people sometimes feel that players should be managed, at the end of the day, it's eleven v eleven, it's on the same pitch. There's only one ball. It's always been the same size. Um yes, yes, levels of quality in, in the actual players and management decisions on how systems play will affect games. But ultimately you expect a certain level from minute one to minute 90 when it comes to attitude, application and work rate and effort. They're things that you can control. Um, and when we, just particularly when we went down, there was that little self-doubt, whether that was because there was loads of young players, there was inexperienced, they hadn't played together. That's by the by for me. They're the 11, the manager picked to play. And going back to exa- right at the beginning what Jimmy said, it's down to the players. It's not down to the manager. No. Um we all saw a video after the game um, on Twitter with one fan telling Joel Campbell, and I quote, to get out of the club where you can. Um, later in the video, there was uh, a barrage of abuse aimed at Arsene Wenger himself, all from two or three feet away as they're boarding the train home back to London. Um, Jimmy, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you say to the fan who made this video? First and foremost, about making videos and that. I mean, everyone's entitled to opinion. You know, supporters go up to certain away games, away games, and they go, and they pay good money, and they're they're entitled to their opinion. They're entitled to uh, give, hear their views, uh, and if the lads have not performed, they're entitled to give their opinion. Uh, the only thing is, I think they've got to, um, I think they've got to realise that sometimes it's, it can be a little bit. Um, Misleading in terms of uh, all this. I mean, back back in our days, Hills, we never had that. All that's it's the media and all the smartphones and whatever. So you see, but you know, you, you couldn't. <laughs> the supporters couldn't, couldn't come up close to you and start making a video of you, could they? They give you a little bit. We got abuse. We got abuse back then. I mean, you know, fans weren't happy with you. They'd give it. They'd, they'd let their feelings be known. But now, they, now we we live in this interactive world where someone will get a smartphone out, put it in front of someone, and start giving someone abuse. Um, that that fan was was probably airing his views. Probably in the wrong way, um, as there has been a little bit in, in, in recent times, recent games where I think there was a banner at one of the games was it West Brom? Yeah. Where, where there's a, there was you know everyone's showing you know, Arsenal Wenger it's the time to give up. You know, there's there's ways of, of expressing your opinions, and I think sometimes fans can get a little bit misleading in in picking their right moment in terms of getting their message across. I mean, we had the banner man on last week, um, and he put up an account of himself. Um, and from what I've seen on our Twitter this week, you know, some people uh, agreed with it, some people disagreed with it. Uh, where was your stance on the banner? Do you think after a win it was the wrong time to do it? Because their their view on it was that they wanted to show that they wanted Arsene Wenger out of the club, win, lose or draw. Um, and I think that was the main reason it came out after a win. But what was your take of the banner itself? Well, I actually, I was one of them guys that put, I don't know, I think I was in India at the time. I was in Delhi uh, when that, that, but I heard about it and I I just thought, um, I think the I think Arsene Wenger deserves a lot more respect than, than, than that banner actually showed. And I think a lot of supporters, personally speaking, 
would, was probably would probably be a little bit embarrassed about that. So again, everyone's entitled to their opinion. They can put up as many banners or give their opinions. As much. We live in a free society. That, that's normal. People are allowed that. But um, I just think again, there's a, there's a time and a place. I mean, you know, the, the boys went and got, got, went away from home, put in a good performance, got three points. It's not a, 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 you know, it's not an easy place to go to the Hawthorns and go and get three points. And the boys done that. And then, you know, to come out and they put a banner up, Arsenal, it's time for you to go, or whatever, somewhere along them lines. I just think Arsene Wenger deserves a lot more respect than that. Um, I, and I think, I think Arsene Wenger, if, he, if he'd seen that, and he probably did, because I think it was quite a large banner by the sounds of it, I, I, th- I think he would have been a little bit um, bemused by that. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that's nice. Mm. And uh, Dave, we'll move over to you. And of course, it's been a few months since you last joined us. And I think last time we spoke um, on the Arsene Wenger situation, you said that, you know, he wasn't performing um, to the limits that he could be. Uh, You know, you were fairly on the fence surrounding, you know, him as manager. As time's moved on, where do you stand with it now? And, And also, what's your view on that banner? Well, First of all, I don't think I've ever been on the fence. I've definitely been one side of it. I've been <laughs> close to the fence, but I'm definitely on Arsene Wenger's side of the fence. All right, so I don't okay. feel splinters in, in the arse hole. Okay, so I think I'm just to clear that up. I'm definitely on that side. Although I do think managers go through, you know, can have a great period, and then they have to make some sort of transition, some sort of change to continue. Uh, re- not reinvent themselves, but you know, like a pop star, you can't go 40 years singing the same song. You've got to change, you've got to move with the times. Um, I think I would personally like to see that happen. Um, I think there's a there's a definitely a long term plan for Arsene Wenger to be part of the club, and he isn't he isn't a, certainly a man who's going to be put all what he's put in and just walk away. So whatever these people do, and like Jimmy said, you're 100 percent entitled to your opinion. You pay your money, you can put a banner up. I'll draw the line at verbal abuse, but if you want to write something on a banner, it's up to the person looking at it, whether they whether they read it and take offense to it or read it and laugh at the person. So we can all we can all judge that person individually, whether he um, whether we thought that was oh that's a good banner or that's a bad banner, or whether you know you're a twat or you're a bit of an idiot, you've not got a life. You know, all those sort of things. But from whatever point of view he done it, that's up to him. And fair play to him stood by it, and that's what he thinks. And I've really not got a problem, you know, at mm. all with that. As far as Wenger goes, I think I can see probably a transitional period where he, he maybe maybe moves upstairs, brings someone in, you know. I think the main thing for, for him is to see the Arsenal way still continue. It's been fruitful over the many years. Maybe mm. both is of recent years, but just as a, as a, as a business, as a commercial entity, and you know, there's there's loads more fans than there was years ago. So the proof of the pudding's in the eating. We all love Arsenal. And, you know, football's that sort of game. You hate it, but you love it. And that's just yeah. how it is. You know, look at Liverpool fans. You could be a Liverpool fan. How bad would that be? You, know, you had a great year last year and you're shit now. I mean, tell me about it. No one even wants to watch you. Even your own, even your own manager turns away. And you've got Brendan Rodgers turning away, put his hand, head in his hands at times. We just had an email from uh, Mr. Shit from Shit Town. He is complaining about being associated and referred to as Liverpool. Sorry, just had to read that out. Though. He's not happy. Well, I don't know. You know that's, that's the way it is. You know, with I'm talking from a football fan's point of view, and you know, I'm not saying Liverpool's a shit town, but they the football's not been good this year, shall we say? No, the club, yeah. not the town. The town's lovely. We love all. We love Liverpool. Uh, mate, I've had some wicked times in Liverpool. I'm just saying, uh, right. just from an Arsenal fan's point of view, looking at, uh, uh, from a Liverpool fan's point of view, they've not had what they expected this season. It's been hilarious though, hasn't it's it? Been, it's been, you know, two extremes from last year to this year. We're just sort of, we should be happy with what we got. We're doing all right. And Wenger in. Mm. Did you say? Don't you think? Oh, don't you sorry. think that the? Uh, sorry, boys. You know, don't you think this is what the problem is? It's the expectations of the Arsenal fans. Would they expect us to to win the league and and you know be in the last knockings of the of the Champions League? Because you know, we know back in your day we only had to overcome like Liverpool, really, didn't we? You know, United was okay, yeah. but you know Liverpool was the team. 
And although they had more money than us, it weren't. It was, it was a different golf than what we've got now. The, the money that Chelsea and City and United have got is a lot more than what it was back in the day when you boys was playing. And what happened at the time, George, he, he created a team and he built a team, didn't he, that could go up there and compete, uh, mm. and which we did. At the moment, you know, they're buying all the best players and it's so, so difficult. I personally think that the expectations of, of some Arsenal fans, they just expect too much right now. We've just, you know, we've had all the bit about the stadium and everything else. But I think the only way we're going to do it again is if we build another team. And that team is going to take three or four years to do. Now, I think we're maybe 18 months into that. I believe, in my opinion, that, you know, Wenger will do it. You know, he'll, he'll get up there again mm. within the next two years. But I'm worried that if he gets the hunt with it all and says, OK, you know, fair enough, maybe I have took us uh, as far as we can go and we get the next man, it's going to be another three or four years. Mm. And, but- and Jeff, after listening to the Banner Man the week before, um, seeing this video that's appeared online this week, um, is it embarrassing? To be an Arsenal fan and have other Arsenal fans that are just so off the charts. Well, I was I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked by that video. Uh, I think I tweeted it out straight away, and I got I got I got thousands of retweets as soon as it as soon as it appeared. And you know, it's it's when you're in a stadium. I know you know a lot of fans they boo players and have a go at players that's all part and parcel of the game you know some players you can't even hear it and then some do hear it you know like a buoy a couple of years ago when when Wenger had to take him off because he was he was just getting booed every time he touched the ball I mean in the stadium you can get away with it a little bit but when I think it's a whole new level when you go to a station right and you wait for a manager and they was waiting for the manager to get off the off the uh, team bus to get on the train, and they started booing him and having a go at him and fuck off out of our club. Blah. I mean, that is just unbelievable yeah. disrespect to a, a yeah. man that's most probably the best manager that's ever managed a club. I agree. Mm. I agree. And 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 your thoughts on the comments made to Joel Campbell? Oh, it's just ridiculous. It's just absolutely ridiculous. You've got a young man there who's, who's just come back into the club from being on loan. He's trying to break him, break into the team. And they're more or less, just to have a go at Wenger again, tell him, oh, Joel, you know, it's best you leave now, boy, blah, blah, whatever they said. You know, that's what, that was the, 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 you know, the knock-ins of it. I mean, get it's out just, while you can. Get out while you can. I mean, what is that? It's ridiculous. You should go and encourage these boys. You know, you, you, you go there, you pay your hard-earned money. And like, like David said, you're allowed to have an opinion. That's, it's, in the stadium, it's not so bad. Going personal on, on on someone like Wenger, you know, who's only five yards away, and it sounded horrific. It sounded like a lot of people there, you know, you know, and there might have only been twenty or thirty people there or something, but it sounded terrible. And I can't, I don't see how they think that's going to do any good for the team. I just can't see it. I don't understand it. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and uh, Danny, next, uh, have you seen the video, and what are your views on it? I thought it, the person who said it sounded a little bit northern. Are you sure it wasn't just, I know some bloke on Twitter who is an alleged Arsenal fan has claimed responsibility for it and his, his name is out there if people want to go and try and find him. But it, to me it sounded like, like it was a northern accent saying it. So maybe someone, I don't know. Maybe no, it was an Arsenal fan. It's definitely sure? an Arsenal oh, fan. Okay, it, just... went, it went boldy, was it? <laughs> yeah. uh, Nico. It's, it's just, yeah. it's just, uh, just what modern, modern society Europe is though, Arsenal. isn't it? <laughs> it's just you've got all these fans that want instant gratification society and uh, it's just bollocks you're not going to change anything by shouting at them and I doubt very much if you go out there cunting off the manager fucking swearing at the players and shouting and screaming and fighting between us the players are going to go oh excellent all the all the fans are behind us hey, let's, let's go out there and win it for everyone no the players are going to think oh I don't like the idea of this lot no it's very, very good that they're not really behind us doesn't help very the situation very good that That's you say thing. that um, because my, my next question goes to Jimmy. Um, Jimmy, did you ever get publicly booed by the fans and, and what effect did it have on you? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I, it's, it's probably common knowledge that I, I, I underachieved personally at, at Arsenal Football Club and, and probably Liverpool as well. Um, although Kenny, Kenny Daglish resigned four weeks after signing me, it was always going to be difficult. But, you know, came to Arsenal, my boyhood uh, club, and um, for me, I, I, I underachieved. I mean, I was up against world-class players. I mean, Hills will tell you. I mean, every single one of the boys was, was international. But you know, there were there were times when I, I went out there, short of confidence, and 
that's one thing you can't have. You know, you, you run out of Highbury and you, you want to be flying, but sometimes for, for various reasons, you're, you're not able to do that. And, and for me, yeah, I mean, there was times when I got, I got booed and I got, a, you know, had a, a lot of frustration from the crowd and it's, it's, it's not nice, because, um, but you've got to deal with that. I mean, you know, we all have that. I mean, I mean, I got, I, I played at Millwood at the den. I mean, there's, there's, there's no more notorious <laughs> places to go and play than you, you football at, at the old den. I mean, at the new den, it's a little bit difficult, but, but different, but the old den was notorious and, you know, got low, you know, so it's one of them where if you're on, if you're on fire, the, the, the fans loved you. But equally, I mean, they were more than happy to share their opinion and being a wide player, close to the fans as well, because you're right there as well, you know, you can hear everything. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you do get a bit of abuse, but really, I mean, that's when a player should be showing his metal and, and, and buckling down and showing, saying to himself, well, OK, I mean, the fans, again, they're entitled to opinion, as I said before. It's then to show your character and come back and, and prove them fans wrong. And, um, I mean, I suppose at Arsenal, that was, that was probably one of the things that I maybe regret that, you know, I wasn't able to show much my my true potential while I was at the club. Mm. Do you know when the? Do you know, sorry about it again, Kim. Do you know when the the manager's under pressure? Obviously, uh, Gleish, I think he just he swallowed it in the end, didn't he? I don't know whether he was under any kind of pressure. They was all disappointed that he left. But you know, like we're talking, going back on the Arsene Wenger thing. You know when the players see that banner and they hear that he's getting booed and 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 whatever at the station there. Yeah. You know that must put a little bit of doubt in the players' minds as well because, you know, you're always got to think ahead and you think, oh, well, you know what, if what happens if he does go, you know, you're going to get a new manager in and like you just said there, Jimmy, you don't really know. So there's always doubt, isn't there? There's doubt. If he goes, yeah. this manager, you know, who's yeah. we going to get in? He might not like me. I might be shipped off. We shouldn't really be having that negative things in our mind, in, in, in the players' minds, should we? Do you agree with that or not? I, I totally agree, and it's not it's not helpful. And also, I, I have to add that you know this is we're talking about this, the Arsenal. I mean, we you know all, the, the club, the, the board of directors, we, everything's always done with a lot of class, and um, you know it's fighting amongst supporters, putting banners up. I mean, we, you don't normally associate that with with um, with Arsenal Football Club. I mean, you, you know other clubs might do it, um, but you know to, for that to be associated with with the Arsenal, you don't really ever see that, and. Uh, I think that the supporters, sorry, that the, the players will be will be disappointed in, in in hearing them sort of comments from the fans and seeing banners, and um, and I'm sure Arsene Wenger will be would dis, be dismayed. I mean, obviously, it's not going uh, as he would like to, to to you know amazingly to plan, and you know it's in, things are in transition, but it's not all, it's not all doom and gloom. It's not like they're bottom of the league or anything. I mean, geez, I don't know yeah. what you think, Ills. I don't know. I, th- I, th- I mean, Jeff. I respect you 100%. And you just said something there that I, I know you wouldn't take in the street and take it on board. If if Arsene Wenger has got 40 people having a go at him, that ain't going to affect him, I don't think, personally. And I don't think the other players would. And as you would, you're you're a businessman. You know, if you, if, if you had a company that had 20 million customers and 40 were unhappy... You're doing all right, mate. You're not going to take much notice if they put a banner outside your house. You're just going to get them moved on. And I think the players, I think they've got a good enough um, relationship with the manager to not let that affect them. And I think the manager will, his first thing will be to put in place that, listen, this is just a group of people who are just expressing an opinion. It's a very small opinion, but that's not going to affect, affect our end game. We're still going to be focused. I don't think, personally, that will have a big effect on Arsene Wenger at all. I think he'll just brush it off. Do, he's, do, he, he's above that, I think. Do you think that Arsene Wenger would have spoken to the players about the banner? No, I don't I, I don't think he would have. I, I think by drawing attention to it, he would be making it seem like it had importance. And he mm. just doesn't come across as the man to do that. Mm. You know, I, I just can't see him doing that. I, he doesn't need to mollycoddle his players that way. Now, maybe from the fact that, oh, you know, you're going to get a bad time at Stoke today. Maybe he's got to do that to him. But I'm sure, as far as criticism and that goes, the players and the managers, they're so professional these days. I'm sure they are above that affecting them. When, when we was players, when, when we Jimmy were talking about criticism, I personally, I think it affects different players different. If you're a forward and you're not scoring goals and you're not getting past people and you know, you're know you not fulfilling your potential, like Jimmy said, maybe he feels that about himself, um, then, yeah, you feel disappointed. 
But from the role I played in the game, I, I only had to make a few tackles and I was happy. <laughs> the, thing that, the thing that made me most unhappy was when I went to the papers on a Sunday morning and I got a six. And I thought I should have got a seven because I made, I made more tackles than you know they, they credited me for. Um, but there's a lot more pressure on forward players. I think defensive and uh, and defenses and defensive players can get over that, mm. and confidence isn't affected as much. Lee, I mean Lee Dixon is a prime example. When Lee came to the club, I didn't think he was like the the the, the dog's bollocks sort of right back. But what Lee had was, he had confidence in his own ability. He He'd make a mistake, brush it off, try the same thing 10 seconds later. It really, any mistake didn't affect him and he had great character. And then he's obviously under Wenger, his ability blossomed. But as a player, a forward players, it's difficult. I think they do get frustrated. They're expected to deliver. Whereas mm-hmm. the rest of the team just have to stop goals. And like one of George's old sayings was, it's a lot easier to destroy than it is to create. So there's always going to be more pressure on forwards. And and when the fans got on your back or, or on the team's back, um, say you had a poor run to the start of the season, you'd had a bad run of games, how did you deal with the pressure? Do, do you deal with it as a team? Or is there any individual methods that you went through? Team bonding. The gaffer, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about it from a, I'm not glamorising a social, socialising point of view. But the first thing the gaffer would say, and you'll agree with this, Jim, I'm sure, is after training, after training on Tuesday, when I've run your balls off Tuesday morning because you've been crap and I'm going to run you into the ground, I want you all to go to the pub this afternoon and enjoy yourself. Don't take your missus, to give your missus some money to go shopping, you're going out with the lads. And that's what he'd say. Which, so we'd get punished and then he'd say, go and bond now and see what you can do together to, to get this back. And we, we, you know... It's great, wasn't it? Proof, proof of the pudding was in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we, did, we didn't need to get, uh, be asked twice to wheels. We were straight out. We'd, we'd come in on a... It, eventually, it got, it got termed the Tuesday club, didn't it? Because we'd come in, as, as Hills quite rightly said, normally we'd train at Shenley um, over in London Coney. Uh, but, but a lot of the times on a Tuesday, we'd get dragged into to Highbury and, he'd, and George would yeah. run us up down the terraces, beast us in the gym, ran the track, and, um, and, and it would be day off Wednesday, see you Thursday. But... Uh, but the, the lads will be bringing in their, 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 their suits and what have you in a little suit carrier on, in, to training. And George knew where we were at. We were at, didn't he? <laughs> we yeah, were... but I think, I think he also knew that we was going to deal with it as well. Yeah. Yeah. When we went out, we didn't, just, we didn't just drink and have a good time. We, yeah. we, we, we addressed certain things that went on that probably you wouldn't address when you were sober. I, Jimmy wouldn't come up to me and go, Eels, you were shit today. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. When he's sober, because he don't want to offend me. But when, when he's had a couple, he'll be honest. And that's but we took that on the chin, and we moved forward with it, and we sort of grew together like that. And so the respect grew, and it didn't take long to get over things. So we didn't have big periods of no success. But again, I agree with Jeff. The expectations were not as high as they are now. You know, all that money, all them players, everybody wants the dream team. You know, you can do it in the sun, you can do it in this paper, you can do it, I can buy whatever player I want. Why can't Arsenal buy all these players? Well, because that's in a newspaper and that's, that's fantasy football. This is real stuff. People need to just refocus and think about where we are and how well we are actually doing. Mm. And we'll underline this segment, um, not unless Danny or Jeff have got anything else to say. Well, you've got, I'll tell you one, one thing for sure. I bet they ain't going up on the fucking train next year to Stoke, that's for sure. No, fly back. <laughs> they, they won't be, they'll be getting the coach for now. They won't have that again, surely. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's not right, is it? Um, but we'll underline the segment now. Um, and I just quickly want to ask Jimmy and Dave. I know, Dave, you've already said, but where do you stand on that whole Arsene Wenger in, Arsene Wenger out? And what's your opinion on him as a manager? Jimmy, we'll start with you. I, I think he's done um, amazingly well over, over the years. He's, he's obviously had some, some, some glory years. He's had some fantastic players at his disposal, which is, he's, you know, he's, he's nurtured players, he's brought players in, and he's, he's turned them into superstars. He's had some great teams. Um, but I think over the years, as it's gone by, um, clubs like Man City, clubs like Man, uh, Chelsea, with the with the financial input that they've they've had into the club, the resources that they've had at their disposal, I think he's found it hard to compete with. And um, you know, I think fans have got to be realise that you can't have it both ways. 
You know, he's, obviously we've had the new stadium to deal with. For me, I, I'm, I'm a great admirer of, of, of Wenger. I mean, you, you just got to look at the style of play. Hills will tell you when we played, it weren't attractive. You know, George George had assembled a side where it was pretty much route one. I mean, you know, we'd get the ball forward to Smudger. He'd flick effective. it on. Effective. Effective. Yeah, yeah absolutely effective. Smudger will flick it on. Right, he's sticking the back of the net. You know, the Arsenal fans now can go every single week knowing that they're going to see good football, good passing football, good movement, quality players passing the ball about. Um, so, and that's Dan Devenga. That's that's no one else. I mean, you know, he's come in. He's done. He's done fantastically well. Obviously, now we're, we're now thinking. You know, it's 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 twenty years down the line. Does he? Is it time for him to go? Obviously, there's going to be some uh, supporters that are going to go. You know what? He's had his time. There's no way he's going to replicate what he's what he's done in, in the past. Time for him to go. Let's ship someone else in. Um, it's, it's it's a difficult call, isn't it? It really is. I think as as one of you guys has alluded to tonight, if you get someone in, he's going to want his own backroom staff. He's going to want to bring players in. Players are going to be shipped out. How long does that take then? You could be looking at another three or four years. So it's, it's, it's a difficult call, isn't it? Mm, very difficult. I mean, what would you say to the the people that want him out that have said that when he came in, he, re- he rebranded English football? Because he did. He, he implemented his own style and pretty much all the other Premier League followed one by one by one by one. And, um, and what would you say to the people that say since that time, football has moved on and say maybe rebranded again, yet he's stuck in his old style? Well, I'm going to jump in there, Kim. Go on, Go on. Right. When when did Germany have their crisis? Was it around about two thousand? The German some, some, some correct, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're talking we're talking fourteen, fifteen years, yeah. So in fourteen and fifteen years, it took that long from them to address their football at grassroots to get to to world champions. Yeah, Arsene Wenger's been in seventeen, eighteen years. Is it? It's got to be that, isn't it? It's, eighteen years, yeah. Yeah, eighteen years. So you know, a little bit, maybe maybe a little bit longer. He has built something now that other teams have bought, period. So that, that's built. Something that's built is much better than something that's bought because the club has a structure. He's not going to walk away from that. I'm Wenger in at the start. I, I, I want to put that in now. He's, he's not going to walk away from that. They've got a proper foundation that will that will keep, you know, keep where they are quite easily. And it will take something else to get them to the next level. So I think we'll we'll operate at the level we are in the league, no problem now. Whether whether Arsenal manages the team or not, they'll stay there. But but to to get to that lo- next level, like all things, um, then there needs to be a little bit of change. But I don't think you can just throw it all away. When when a new manager comes to a club, I'm sure now when when you go to Marino going to Chelsea, he's not looking at their youth development really. He's not looking at their under. 12, seeing who's coming through, because he's not looking at being there in six years. Whereas Arsene Wenger has, and he's put all that in place, and he won't just toss all that away because another manager will come in and just manage the first team. The rest of it will go to waste, and Arsenal, the club as a whole, philosophy, directors, all the people, they're not going to let that happen. They've built built a, a, a conveyor belt now, a machine that's, that's going through the proper cycle. Um, I think, personally, and what I would like to see is him, him achieve as much as he can maybe this season with what he's got and then maybe look at bringing someone in who's, who can, who's going to do what he does but bring their own little twist on it. So just a, another little addition, maybe a little bit of more steel, maybe a sort of Klopp type person who he could work alongside or a Guardiola maybe who's got the rapport with the players who can bring people in. But I think every now and then you need a little shake up. I, I mean, a lot of our fans would have looked at the situation at Man United um, and seen that Ars- uh, Alex Ferguson sorry, appointed David Moyes on his own recommendation. Now, do you think that our fans are looking at that and going, Arsene Wenger can't pick the next manager because that hasn't worked in that way? So, so what would you say was the best way of working? Would you say that it was the best way for him to pick his manager and just kind of babysit him for for a period of time until he just takes the rein and is in, is comfortable to do it, you know, himself? Dave? Yeah, yeah I, 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 think, I think that is the way it will happen at Arsenal. But I think it will be a much better way at Arsenal than it was at Man U. I think there was different issues at Man U. Man U didn't have, didn't have any... They, they've stopped producing young players. Boom. 
their cut off had happened. Ferguson had noticed that he was getting out on a high. He needed to get someone in, and I think it was kind of a an easy get out for him. Oh, I'll pick the best English manager at the moment, who's in, who's got the best profile, who's tipped to be the best. Everyone will settle for that. We'll chuck him in. It should it should be okay, but he had to then bring players in and do what Van Gaal's done. You know, have have and Moyes simply didn't have that um, draw to other players. Moyes weren't going to get Falcao there. Moyes ain't going to get Di Maria there. Do you know what I mean? It's got to be someone like Van Gaal who's, who's done that. Um, but with Arsenal, it's a bit of a different thing because Van Gaal's had to buy a team. Arsenal was still building one. So I think the next manager that comes in will, will have to follow that philosophy, use the young players, build, draw, bring players through, bring them on, as well as adding one or two stars. But I think with the business model of football being more money orientated they will have to be a more modern manager more open to paying 45 million for maybe three or three players a year rather than just one every year or every two years i mean it's very interesting what you've said there um with uh, the manager at the club having influence over the the quality of player that's brought in and and jeff will go to you now do you think arsene wenger has that much of an influence over the quality of player that is brought in i mean do you think that if we went down to say and it is merely an example so don't scrutinize me afterwards so if we went for a manager the level of Moyes, do you think immediately we don't appeal to say if we had Moyes in charge would we not have got alexi sanchez in the summer no, I, I don't think so. No one in the world, you know. Oh, right. Moyes' style of play. See, this is the problem I've got as well. You know, people want to get rid of, <coughs> pardon me, uh, Wenger. It's the philosophy and the, and the way he plays football. Right, we, we, we've all been spoiled by that now. I do I do hear on Twitter people tell me all the time, oh, we don't even play any, I don't enjoy going anymore. I don't even like the style of football anymore. Well, mate, honest to God, I don't know what they're watching because at least you'll go and see a passing game. Uh, and, and no disrespect for the boys, you know, I saw all that Graham period and, and before him, you know, Bertie, me and all that. Uh, our, our Arsenal style, when we went 1-0 up under the George Graham years, other teams used to think, well, fuck this, this is all over because we're not going <laughs> to score. We, they, they were so strong at the back and they were so all, well organised. They just, no one was going to score against us, you know. With Arsenal, all right, they, they, you can score goals against us, yes, no doubt about it. But it's the style of play, his it, attacking philosophy, and, and that's the way he plays. I'm worried about the next manager that comes in. We need to continue that because otherwise we will lose support. You know, Arsenal, it's not only uh, Wenger's brought that and he's built the brand up, not only. Uh, just by the style of play, play, the way he plays football. They're very, very attractive to watch all the way around the world. People want to watch us. And that's the problem I've got with it. Mm. Um, We'll draw a line and draw this then, and we will move on. Um, The next game we've got to talk about is Galatasaray's game on Tuesday night. Um, And I think the first thing on the the first place we should start is that goal. Um, Dave, Aaron Ramsey's goal, is that as good as it gets? Oh, I just think it's it, it's one of those moments in time, isn't it? It's it's like if it, it it's only a millionth of a second either side of, of his foot being in that position at that time and swinging at that speed that that never happens. It, it, it is a it is a lottery ticket shot. Um, it we you know, lots of goals are scored in training that are spectacular, but the way it was only a couple of inches off the ground and the, it was just a smooth swing and it just blue with a tiny bit of bend it was you know it, it, it was just one of those you can't practice that no Would one you, of the one of the, I was going to say one of the most amazing things about it sorry to cut you off there um was the fact that when he swung through it you see a lot of players swing through the ball when he hit the ball his leg just immediately stopped yeah he done he done like a stun didn't he I mean we all and that's what makes it even better because we all we're trained a certain way we know to strike the ball use a follow through you know, concentrate, keep our head down, focus on the ball, blah, 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 all of that sort of stuff. Don't look up. You, you should know where you're striking, you know, your contact point on the ball. But he tried to add a little bit of spice to that and do a little bit of a chop and a little bit of a sting on it. So he knew he was going to stun it. He knew he was going to put a little bit of spin. And to be honest, I think even in his wildest dreams, he wouldn't have thought that was going to go there. You know, okay. not at that speed, not at that pace. I, I would imagine he's not scored or struck a ball like that before. Um, 
Yeah, it was, and, and he needed it. And that was the other thing. He really needed it. That's oh, just what Aaron Ramsey needs at the moment. He's been he's been scratching around for a goal. It's been affecting his game. He's not been effective in other other areas because of it. I feel and he's got it now. So put that to bed and get on with your game and get back to what you was like last season. And and Jimmy, we'll come to you next. I mean, how much of a boost in confidence would that could have? that goal would have given Ramsey. I mean, we've said a lot on this show over the past couple of weeks. It looks like he's trying to force his football again, like he was a couple of seasons back. Um, you know, last season, we saw him just run onto the ball and absolutely hammer it. And nine times out of ten, it was going in the top corner. Um, how much of a important goal was that for him to boost the confidence? I think it'd be a goal of major importance. I mean, we spoke about, we've spoken about confidence this, this evening and, uh, Aaron Ramsey is one of them players that, that thrives on, on being confident and being loved. And, and last year, he had a tremendous half season until he got injured. And then, um, obviously, he came back a little bit. But, uh, and he's not been as good this year, that's without a doubt. But on, on the other night, I'm always fortunate enough to, to be doing the, the co-coms in the studio at the Emirates with the boys away at Galatasaray. And both me and the, the commentator, we were just like, we couldn't believe that strike. It, it literally it came out, and as, as Hill says, it could not have struck that any sweeter. Um, I mean, he scored just before then, didn't he? He'd, he'd scored one. He put one in the bottom corner, hadn't he, by that time? Yeah. So yeah. his confidence was obviously high, and he just thought, you know what? I'm going to go for this. It, it just dropped perfectly for him. Um, he scored a wonder goal against Liverpool last year, didn't he? It just dropped perfectly for him. We volleyed it. For me, this tops that by, by far. And it, it literally was one of them goals where... He would have gone to, he'd be going to bed that night just dreaming about that, that strike, that moment, a split second where he's made contact with that. And he couldn't, I mean, if you had two keepers in there, they wouldn't have saved that. It was just a perfect no. strike, and he put it in the top bins. Top, top goal. And uh, luckily, Danny, indecision off the pitch um, is the game, as he thought, the goal at Norwich was better than the goal that he scored against Galatasaray. Um, luckily enough, I think he went in the dressing room and he saw it and he came out and he said the Galatasaray goal was better. Um, Danny, which one for you, Norwich or Galatasaray? Um, I think I'll have to go with, with the Welsh legend and say it's going to have to be the Galatasaray one. Did you see that video that I put in our WhatsApp group where I recorded him saying it? Yes. Oh, that was absolute. I mean, this just, just shows the quality of the bloke for him to, to, to have the interview, go away and then watch it and come back and go, oh, can I just have a little bit? And they go, what? And go, yeah. I Actually, I've looked at it again and I think that was by far my best goal. I mean, all these people, that just shows how fickle Arsenal fans are. They tend to be the younger fans. that They're writing Ramsey off already this season. I've said all season, Ramsey and Wilshere don't work together because Ramsey is the attacking goal scorer. Wilshere isn't. But when Wilshere plays, he thinks he's Pele. And I said when Ramsey got when Wilshere got injured, I said, "You watch Ramsey will go on now and have a better game." And what's he done? Three goals in two games and two assists. We did. So we have been saying it over the last couple of weeks we that have. without Wilshere there to stunt his game, yeah. he'll play more of his own game and 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 thus will maybe get back to where he was. But I love um, I love I love Wilshere and Ramsey. I love all of the young Arsenal British players. But Wilshere needs to play the same role for Arsenal as he does for England, and then he will turn out to be a fantastic player with a decent decent career because if you're defending more you're not going to get kicked every time you've got the ball because you're the one doing the tackling and passing the ball around so when it, his usual thing is hold on to the ball for a little bit too long and then rather than play it off to someone it will get kicked mm. and if he plays further back he can do the kicking and and, and Jeff I want to go to you next I mean how important to Arsenal is a peak Aaron Ramsey well, we, we, his spell last year was, was phenomenal, wasn't it, when he was on form? And uh, like the boys have said about confidence, Aaron Ramsey, I think he's one of those guys that, that uh, he, he, you know, he needs, his, he needs his confidence to be top, top quality. Um, he's obviously got a bit of steel about him because when he was having his bad time two years ago, he kept on playing, he kept on going at it, and he kept on trying and trying and trying. And he did play himself into that fantastic period and like David alluded to he, he got injured in that sport a little bit before he come back for the final but you know it is vital you got you got then top players like that you do need them playing and you don't you don't it's, it's you can get away with one one of them maybe not being on his game you know but if you've got two or three of them that are not really on their on their mark then you do suffer as a team I think and and to get Rambo back and uh, I think that's going to make him his confidence is going to be high now hopefully you know he can he can go and he can get another couple of goals and uh, you know we can push on from there and just before we go on and talk about the match, a quick one for all of you, and I'll ask you yes, no, simply. Um, 
will we see a better goal in the Champions League this season than that one? Uh, Dave? No. Jimmy? No. Danny? Only if Ramsey wants to. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Jeff? No, I don't think so, mate. Fantastic. Um, right then, let's go on and talk about the well, game. How about and you the... answer it? Mr. Gimley, no. will we see a better Champions League goal this season? I'm just the host. No one cares what I think. Don't they? Uh, I think they no. do. They love no. you. Um, no, I don't think we'll no, see a better a goal. What a fucking waste of time that question was. You could have done something original like I did, but no. We're, we're not even going to do the... Just the... get back to hosting. You're winding me up now. Okay, fine. Um, so let's get back to the overall performance. Um... After Stoke, it was such a different story. Um, why did they play so different, Jimmy? I think two things, actually. Uh, Arsenal went out from the very, very first whistle, uh, took the game to Galatasaray. I think they just felt that they had something to prove. There's, there were, you had boys who were coming in, who like, like the likes of Podolsky, um, who hasn't played for, for a long time. Um, you had lads coming in. Bellerin was, was, was at left-back, done extremely well getting forward. I just think we just took the game to them. I have to say, Galatasaray defensively was shocking. I mean, they showed why they were bottom of that of that that particular league. They were they, they started off. They they were it was very very open. They would have an attack, but when they lost the ball, Galatasaray. I mean, the Ox was fantastic. Joel Campbell, I have to say, Campbell was 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 absolutely fantastic first half, and well, we, we just kept nicking the ball off them, and we just broke with with precision, uh, assertiveness, uh, and we were so positive. And to be fair, at half time, it, we could have been six 0 up. We mm. literally could have been six 0 up. It was like they they were embarrassing at the back. Every time we got forward, we looked like we were going to score. Second half, obviously they've had a right rollicking. They've come out and had a little go, obviously in front of their, their home fans, which you expect them to do. And the boys dug in. So for me, it was a fantastic performance. But in the first half, the boys were absolutely on fire. So positive. And. and- Dave, there were a lot of people that said that we could have actually topped that group. Um, at half time, you know, we walked out 3 0. We could have quite easily gone on and scored another um, three. But he changed the team about, didn't he? Um, and it looked like they were pretty much settled into that score, just an away win and just see out the group. Um, what would you say to the people that scrutinised Arsene Wenger for not going to top the group? I would say. Maybe he was just a bit worried about the Anderlecht game when we was a few goals in front in that one and would rather just qualify for sure and win the game rather than risk that. Um, Also, I don't think he probably looks too much into whether we top the group or not. Qualification is important. Once you get into that last group of teams, it's it's pretty much an even playing field. It's, it, you know, it is the team that turns up on the day. If if you get, you know, you, I mean, I mean, what I'm looking at the teams we could get: Madrid, um, Real Madrid, Monaco, Porto, Bayern Munich, Barcelona. Yeah, the the list is, it, is uh, Bayern, Atletico, Barca, Real, Porto, Monaco. Yeah, I just said that again. Cheers, mate. Just um, in a different order. <laughs> that's fine. I'm only, I'm only taking the Michael, but but I'm saying, look, how do you separate any of them teams? If I was going there as an Arsenal player, I wouldn't be looking, thinking, you know, I, I, I could be playing against any of them or I could be, I look at the teams who have finished second in those leagues. They're probably just as daunting as them. You're going to have to play against the good teams. I know it's been a bit of a, um, a bit of an Achilles heel for us when we've got to this stage in recent years. But it, one time you're going to overcome that and that'll be the time when you go on and you, and you conquer. So, listen... He, he's not going to be too worried about that. He wants to win the game. The game's going well. We didn't want to risk no um, sort of negativity. He didn't want to damage the confidence. Maybe yeah. he could see Galatasaray were making an effort second half. Or if they get back at 4-3, four, 4-2, four, it's going to look sort of a bit... Our players might not have the confidence they're going to take from a 4-1. I'll take a 4-1 second place and we'll do it, we'll do it the, the more difficult way. But you've got, you got to face your demons at some point in time. Mm. And and Danny, you are a, a regular Jimmy Savile of the podcast. You know the youngsters that came on. Um, what what were their names and how well did they do? Ashley Maitland Niles. He come. See, on. I told you. Hey, now then, now then, now then, now then. 
Oh. Don't we'll have complaints again. He's smoking a fat one. He he, <laughs> he came on for Ramsey, and I think he's a I think he's a bit of a defensive midfielder. I'm not sure why I think he's a left back. Probably because he's got lots of L's in his name, and I associate that with left back. And then Gideon, no 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 no, the 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 LLM. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. I'm here all week. He came on for Flamini, and so I think those two um, held the central midfield. I think they did all right. There wasn't too much pressure on them. I mean, when, when Galatasaray have uh, realised they're 3-0 they're down, and if they try and attack, we're just going to counter-attack and ruin them. And then the other player to come on was um, Stefan O'Connor, who I'd never heard of, strangely. He's, I think he was a centre-back, but he came on and played right-back. Is another good, decent player. And we had uh, um, Bellerin playing from the start. So it's really, really good. And plus, um, Sonogo played, who you would consider a youth player. I mean, a young player. And then Joel Campbell, who's another young stroke youth player. And uh, I mean, you forget that the Ox played the entire game. And the Ox isn't exactly an old man. He's only 21. So we've got all these young players. I think the average age of the start in 11 was about six months old. I don't see that, Dan. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think you should um, you should gauge a player by his age anymore. You should say by his salary. If he's earning twenty grand a week, he's an experienced player, and he should be doing the business. Yeah, that's... so no go. He's not a young player. He's on twenty five grand a week. He should be doing the business, mate. He's a, he's an experienced player. We were talking pre-pod and I said that Jimmy's got two goals in 29 games for Arsenal. I said he's, he's better than Sonogo. <laughs> yeah, but you've got to remember, Jimmy was only on 200 quid a week. So, you know, he was playing to his, <laughs> he was playing to his level, wasn't he? I was, on, I was on 80s. That's why I only got two goals. Uh, then we had tax as well, didn't we? Taxes, big taxes. What was your, what was when you know, you know when you was APs, what was your, what was your, what was you on, a tenner a week or something, 12 quid a week, something like that? You was apprentices. 25s I was on. It 25. was 25. I came along a bit later than Jimmy. I was on twenty-seven fifty, first year, and thirty-five the second. But they used to Arsenal were good. They used to send hundred and sixty quid a month home for your digs, forty quid a week. And my old girl used to give me hundred and twenty quid back, so I was all right. So back God in the bless day, her. back in the no, day when you two were playing, um, and and you saw the likes of Ian Wright come in, and he was on I think about six or eight grand a week. Did you look at that and think football's gone mental, not realising that now you'd have the morons like Rooney on three hundred grand a week? You could never envisage something like that, could you? Well, it's just it's, it's the way it is. You could go back another thirty years and say, bloody Jordy Armstrong probably earned in his career what what I earned in five years, and yet look at the sort of player he was. So it's it's relative, you know, it is what it is. Sure. Right place, right time. You are where you are. You know all of that stuff. But do you think football? Be, do you think football would be better off if the players weren't on such a massive amount of money? Do you think they'd care more about no. their game? No, I don't. I just think it's the market. It's a market-driven thing. It's nothing to do with the players. They play. They play for a, a decent professional salary. You know, a businessman salary, a, a few hundred grand a year. Players are probably played for that. But the trouble is, the other influences are acting upon them and upon their agents and upon sponsorship. Everything's pushing everything, so there's there's more money in the game. And let's get and let's get it right. Everyone will be playing for nothing anyway. If you you know you, you a lot of them players play a Sunday league, they play it, they go and kick yeah. arms out of each other. You know you just want to play football, don't you? It's yeah. it's a consequence of how good you are. Is is the salary you're getting? That's all it is. is. That, well, the, the consequence is you either you either get a good salary that supports you to play football full full time, or you get a half decent salary and you have to play football part time and get two hundred quid a week, or you. You know, you, you might be the bloke who earns 200 quid a week who still turns out every Saturday for his Sunday side. It's it's all it's all relative. But if you're asking someone to be at the top of the game right now with the money that's in football, they want they they? They they getting a million pound a year each. That's what their their level is minimum. Yeah, and that, I agree with that. You know, they're, although they're not as good as players like me and Jimmy were, <laughs> me and Jimmy were, and now we'd be on we'd be on mills. We could fit into that. Fit into that system, we'd have all their training. Yeah, I, I, I think it is different though, Hills, a little bit because yeah. you know, th- when we were playing, I mean, I remember when I signed for Arsenal, the day I signed for Arsenal, I came down f- on a flight from Liverpool. I turned up, I went in with Frank McClintock, who was at the time my, my agent, walked into to the office. George Graham was on the golf course, he weren't even around. So I was sitting down with Ken Fry, and I went, What's the, what's the deal? He went, that That's what we're offering you, and it weren't like uh, it wasn't even up for negotiation. It was like well, yeah. that's that's what you're getting, and it was um, and it was like, oh, all right, f- where's the pen? It was literally you signed because you wanted to sign yeah. for the Arsenal. Yeah. You know, that, that is tra- it is different. It was it is a lot different now. I mean, I think listen, I don't know. If we use the word mercenary, but I mean, there's a lot less loyalty and a lot. They they a lot of the players go for the pan note now, don't they? 
Oh yeah. oh yeah, but I, th- I think it's that, that's that's because the market What's... drives it that way, Jim. It doesn't encourage you to stay at the same place for ten years and 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 you know live out your dreams. It's not designed for that anymore. It's designed to make you financially secure for the rest of your life. That's what you're going. We as we as young players, when we jo- when we joined a club at sixteen, the first thing we was told was it's a ten year career. You're going to have to do something after. Make the most of what you got, right? But now kids don't go into it with that. It's a 10-year career that can pay for every single day of the rest of your life. And you don't have to work again. You can walk away with 20 mils and be an ordinary player and just have a £2 million a year contract for 10 years. 40 grand, you know what I mean, a week in, in championship or, or, or the premiership. Do 10 years, average average out that, you're sorted for life. Our, our, our end game wasn't that. Our end game was to play for Arsenal, to win yeah. FA Cups, yeah. to, to do those sort of things. We weren't I, looking at... Yeah. But we didn't have agents looking for it and everybody else helping us. And at the end of the day, where would you rather be when you're 40? Would you want medals or would you want to be secure? It's a tough call. It comes down to you. I've got, I've got a, medals and I'm happy. So, you know, all is for courses. It's a very, very tough question, isn't it? And, and it's very, very interesting. Um, Jim. Before you yes. go on, talking about the money in Premier League football, I just read, read an article a little while ago. Michael Vix, the quarterback for the Seattle, um, oh, the, the the Falcons. Sounders. Yeah, no, the Fal- <laughs> the I think it said Seattle. Um, oh, you've blown me now. He's um done a I ten year. Not. Oh dear, you've lost again. Me now. A ten year contract, <laughs> one hundred and thirty million dollars, and he can get a thirty seven million in bonuses over a ten year contract. Wow. Is he happy? Is he happy though? <laughs> I don't think he gives a fuck. <laughs> he's too high on yeah. happiness and money. I, I bet you he still cries himself to sleep though. So that's 167 yeah. million he could get over a decade. That's 16 million, you know, and they, they only play about five games a season. You know what though? When he when he when he completes a 50, 60 yard pass, it still feels the same as when he was on 500 quid a week. Yeah, it's true, true. Yeah. Amen to that. Same, so it takes you right back to it takes you right back to it being a market driven thing. You know, is he ain't gonna get no more adrenaline, no more buzz out of throwing a ball really good one to his mates in the park than he is completing a one in the, the Super Bowl. It's just just you know, the feeling's the same, the stakes are a little bit higher. Yeah. Well, I bet all those zeros in his bank account make him well, very, very happy. It'll, 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 it'll make a bit of adrenaline night, when, when it? he looks at his bank palette, so wouldn't he? <laughs> Yeah, Saturday night's a good night out <laughs> when you when you when you when you got them mills. He wouldn't have to go and do shitty podcasts in his spare time for fuck all cash when he retires, will he? Talking about cash, you got yeah, back to the minute, Where did you get the fuck all from? Hey, hey, hey! Sticky bums. You know, you didn't tell me that. You sucked me That's right. Enough, mate. <laughs> yeah, no. Hey, do you want my sort code and account number now? No, oh, seriously. I'll take, terms... take rupees. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> the only terms of payment we really do in this podcast is normally you get a, a curly whirly and a, and a tin of umbongo. Oh, we're, well, back Jimmy, we're back to Jimmy Savile me, again, aren't we? Me and, <laughs> me and Jimmy have got a business plan for you, Gim. Go on. We've got a business plan. We're, we're, we'll contact you um, outside of the pod, but for all the podcast listeners, um, things are going to get it good around there. They're going to get really good. Oh, we've been doing this shit for two years and I've not even made a penny. I feel I'm yeah, in debt. Worry. We're going to get, we, you know, you know <laughs> we're, 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 we're going to take it over. We'll take, oh, excellent. Another, we'll, take, we'll take it to another level. Don't worry, we'll look after you. <laughs> we're going to be millionaires, boys. <laughs> You're a major stakeholder, Jeff, by the way, straight away, all right? You're in the oh, oh, superb. Um, well, I'm on. I'll, I'll beg the 10 shirt. You can get yourself oh, no, a no, scooter, no. Jeff. Right. We, we should get back to the game then, fellas. Um, oh, no. Jimmy, I wanted to come to you next. Uh, Podolski got a brace, and is it fair to say he drifted in and out of the game? Is he worth game time? I think if you ask Lucas Podolski uh, that question, I think he would, he would say he is. I mean, he's always he's a class player. He, whenever he's, he's called upon, he, he delivers. Um, he seems to be better come off the bench. Though, don't I don't know. I mean, Arsene Wenger seems to have a little bit of a problem starting him. Um, and he always... But when he comes on, I mean, he, he is a class player. I mean, he showed with them a uh, couple of finishes the other night that, um, especially his first one, I think he scored a very, very similar one when they played against Dortmund, uh, I think last year or the year before. Yeah. He just literally smashed it, and before the even keeper even blinked, it's in the back of the net. He's got that ability, um, and he's got such a, a such a sweet strike. He is a class player. Um, he, he's, he, I would think he's probably a little bit frustrated that he's not getting as much game time as he would like. But that's, I mean, I suppose he, he also also realizes 
he's at Arsenal Football Club and you've got a, an array of wishes, especially in the midfield area. And, and, and Merston said after the game that, in his opinion, he was the best finisher at Arsenal Football Club. Um, do you agree with that? What, the Podolski is the best finisher? Yeah. I think in certain situations, when he's got it on his left foot and uh, he's, he's got... Sometimes he doesn't... He's got a very, very short back lift as well. Sometimes he just... He just it's that power, isn't it? And he just yeah. smashes it. I mean, I don't know if he's the, the, the best finisher. But I'd, I'd probably... He's got to be up there. I'm just thinking about who would, who would rival that. Um, I mean, the three goals that Danny Welbeck scored against Galatasaray would probably yeah. say different. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, there's lots of talk that Podolski might move on in January. Um, mm-hmm. Dave, for you, is that a good move or do you think we should hold on to him for a bit longer? I, I think he's great for the club. You know, his, his, his return is fantastic. Minutes played to goals is one of the best ratios in Europe, I think. Um, but in saying that, he, you know, can, he, can he do it for 90 minutes? We've seen him, he's more of an impact player. He's, he's, he comes on with a purpose and a point to prove and gets a result from his own personal point of views. He'd probably want to be playing regular every week. But, alluding to what Jimmy said earlier, he's at Arsenal. He's happy. He's a good side. He's with a great group of people. He always has got a smile on his face. I, I don't see a happier Arsenal player. And, no. and you, know, you know, for someone who's not in the side, that's a difficult thing to carry off. You know, as a footballer, I know it's disappointing. And you... You, you don't take offence to people being in the team in front of you, but, you know, it burns, it hurts you. Yeah. It's got to hurt. Uh, and, but he shows that. So for, I think I think keep him there. He's on, he's on a good screw. He's on he's on a nice few quid every week. He's still getting in his national side, uh, probably at, at, at the level he would be. So, yeah, a bit more game time, but um, he's, he's a great player to have at Arsenal. And you've got to have, you've got to have a player who's as good as a player who's playing in the first team in reserve for every position. To win things, yeah, I agree. And you and you think you take Podolski out of that team? Who is there to step up in his yeah, position yeah. that's going to be as good as him? Well, it's going to be Sonogo, isn't it? And and he's not proven yet. He's at that level. He's done well. He's a good kid, but I don't think he's at he's at that level. He's not in that position. I mean, that's a a very good point you raise. Um, Danny, I'll, I'll come to you. You were always a big fan of Lucas Podolski. I've noticed in the in the last few months, you've kind of gone off of him as a player, um, whether that's because his performances um, sometimes have been under par, whether that's just that he's not had the game time that you would like. Um, what's your stance on him now as an Arsenal player? Do you like him? Do you, you know, do, do you hope that he'd get more games? Do you think he's the man that can fire us, you know, uh, you know, 20 goals a season? Yeah, if you played him up front every single game in in every single competition, he would get you 20, 20 goals a season easily. It's just that he's one of those players, much like Arshvin, he heal like a dog, that if you don't play him where he, he wants to play and you don't play him regularly, he's not going to do it for you. And my, I gave up backing him at the FA Cup semi-final and the final. He was rubbish in both of those games. And I think he'll even admit himself he was rubbish in those games. I think he may have been struggling with, with a little bit of a niggle because he went on to the World Cup and got injured in the World Cup almost straight away. But I think on his day, he was he's just absolutely brilliant because I think he scares people with how hard he hits that ball because one day he's going to take someone's head off with it. I think we persevere with him, but he will leave. I mean, I think he probably signed a four-year contract which, which runs out in a, a year and a bit's time. So he'll either stay and then move on because I think by then, in in a year and a bit's time, he's going to be about thirty-ish. So he's uh, he'll move on for a, a, a one final massive big payday. Maybe go to and go and play in Galatasaray or somewhere like that. It's places that will pay you an absolute fortune, and then maybe come back and finish his career at his his beloved for, um, Cologne. But yeah. I just think that his his days have gone. He's uh, he knows he's not really going to be the starting player. Not when they keep bringing. Not when you're playing Sonogo ahead of him. When you've got 121 caps for Germany and 47 goals, and you see some bloke who most of the time isn't even pointing the right way. Don't and forget the World Cup winners' medal. Yeah, he's got that as well, hasn't he? He's, a, he's one of them players that you just, no matter what he does, you can't help but love him. He's right out there with Arshavin for me. Players mm. who you just really love to watch, but just if if you don't tickle them, they don't play well. No, I, I think also it's players you love to watch that frustrate the shit out of you. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the things. Um, Jeff, we'll let you get the final word on Podolski. Uh, stay, go. Would you like to see him more time in the team? Well, I, as David said, uh, you know, he's a fantastic football club like Arsenal. And in my honest opinion, I think if he leaves Arsenal, he's not going to go somewhere better. He'd go somewhere worse than Arsenal. Uh, he's a good squad player. 
it's going to be difficult to get into the team because I, I believe there are better players in front of him. I, I don't think he gets about the pitch enough to really affect it. With regards to his finishing, there's no doubt about it. He's, he's fantastic. You know, he most probably is the best finisher at the club, pound for pound. But, you know, it's, 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 it's a team game. Like I said, I, I don't think he, he does as much for the team as what other players do. Should he get a run in the, in, in the side, a starting place? I don't know. I don't think so. But it's a squad game and he will get games, definitely. There's no doubt about it. And as he's proved when he has come on and has appeared, you know, he's been invaluable to us so far. So, you know, he's having a decent run at the minute. Let's, let's crack on and, and, you know, see if he can carry on with it. Whether he'll go, I think if he's going to go any time, it'll be in the summer. Hmm. And um, we um we should talk about the the next segment of the uh, Champions League. Um, I've already read out the teams as is Dave. Uh, Bayern, Atletico, Barca, Real Madrid, Porto, and Monaco. So the question is, which one of them would you take, Jimmy? Probably Monaco. If, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll probably go for Monaco. I mean, they're all they're all top teams, as David said earlier. Uh, you you got to play the best teams uh, throughout throughout. The- Season uh, throughout the, the competition, if you want to get, if you want to reach the, the, the you know, the final. final. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think out of all of them, I think Monaco. I mean, they came down in the Emirates Cup earlier in the season. They, they looked half decent, but um, I don't think Arsenal will be going into uh, any of the knockout stages for you know fearing anyone. You've got to play them home and away, and they've got as good a chance as anyone. Exactly, uh, Dave. Over to you next. Which one out of those? I, I think I totally agree with Jimmy. I was at the Emirates, um, Emirates Cup start of the season and I think we got the beating of that team. You've got to remember they came there with their season only a week away, so they was nearly at full speed. And we was um, we, we, we was probably sort of running on about 60% and I didn't see nothing that really would give us a problem. And I think we kind of, we, we, because of our stumbles at this, this stage, um, before it maybe will be nice to have an easier fixture or one we can see mentally to be easier so that we can just go in and play. I don't think it matters who we play, but I think from a mental point of view, it, it, it may just give them the edge and say, look, we're playing against probably the, the least um, dangerous team of, of, of the ones we could have. Aren't we lucky? That's almost like a free pass. Let's get on with it and play our own game. So, for me, Monica. Okay. Uh, Danny? Uh, I like a bit... Um, it's going to have to be the obvious answer, isn't it? Either Porto or Monaco. I think Monaco are a very poor team. They had all that money spent on them by that bloke who decided he can do a Man City and buy the club. And then he went, eh, I don't fancy it anymore, and then left them. And then managed to milk Man United for 30, £32 million for Falcao, who is probably about 60, not the 28 he pretends he is. So that's a right old deal. So um, either of those two will beat them. They've got a couple of in-form players at Monaco. Porto, I think they're, they're, they're not too bad, but I think it's any of those two. But we're not going to get either of those two because FIFA haters. So we're probably going to get a Bayern, Munich, Athletic, Real Madrid, Barcelona 11. Not the, the old hot, cold balls again, That's man. it. Oh, dear. You Story love of my life every morning. <laughs> what I want to do for the Predictions League, and I will speak to Kate as well, is I want to let all the boys have a prediction for who we're going to get next round. And if anyone gets it bang on, that's another three points to the Predictions League. Um, I can't so we'll fiddle it anymore, can I? No, you can't. You've got, well, you can't fiddle with anything. But, uh, You're really not doing anything for your reputation, Jimmy. Oh, no, <laughs> then. Behave yourself. <laughs> There's only one Jimmy on this podcast. I would have said two. No, that was that was a that was a song sung about um, Andy Gorham in Scotland when he had schizophrenia. Oh yeah, I remember There's that one. Two Andy Gorhams. <laughs> <laughs> Football fans, <laughs> best in the world. Uh, um, hey. Jeff, harsh, harsh isn't it? it yes, is a bit harsh. <laughs> Which uh, one would you take? You know, I think we could we could overcome uh, any of the three of Atletico, Porto, or Monaco. I really do. Um, I don't mind any of those three. I think we could. I prefer Porto or Monaco, no doubt. But you know, they're tough games anyway. You get into this stage, you never know. You like, like Dave said, it all depends how you, how you turn up on the day. You know, but um, we're going to get Bayern. I know we are. It's just nailed on. It's just so hard for us. <laughs> it's just hope we get a little bit of luck this time because we've had we played Barcelona twice 
AC Milan and then Bayern Munich twice, it, you know, it don't get much tougher than that, does it? So no. let's, let's get a little bit of a chance and give us a, let's to try and do a Chelsea and draw someone like, I don't know, Cannon Town Rovers or something like that. That'd be easier. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, we'll, so we'll do those predictions. Jeff, you're going Bayern, are you? Um, yeah, I think we're going to get Bayern. Okay, Danny? Um, I'm going to go Atletico Madrid. Jimmy? Well, I'm going to go Porto then. Okay, and Dave? Uh, I've gone for Monaco, and I reckon we'll get them. Okay, and I'm going for Real Madrid. I think we're going to get Real. Um, But we'll move on then, and the final things to do pretty much is our Facebook and Twitter questions. So I can put this on mute and it over to Danny. Uh, are you, have you got to go, Dave, or are you, are you staying for a few questions? I know you're hungry and tired and bored. And I'm going to run down because I've got a new puppy. She's crying her eyes out downstairs. She needs to have a pee. Yeah. I need some food. There's cider in the fridge. <laughs> and there's a sofa with my name on it, mate. <laughs> oh. She's taking a piss, isn't he? So oh, close. dear. Put... No, I, yeah, <laughs> no, he I'll, I'll he doesn't know. He does... well. Yeah, you're right, Gim. He doesn't know about sofa gate. Gimli can't talk to Gimli about sofas. He'll get angry. Yeah, He's not had the best of luck. All right, Dave, cheers for joining us. No worries, mate. Well, no doubt. Have you on question? again soon? Have you not got a question for me then from Twitter before I go? Oh, right, then fair enough. You got a question? I, yes, yes I do. I thought you said no. Yeah. Piss off! I've got to go. I said chuck a couple in and I'll bugger off. Oh right, okay. I'm busy reading stuff. Right, see if we can find one. There was a few that was. Uh, um, no, that's not. That won't do for you. Uh, where was the one for Dave? Oh, uh, on couldn't Twitter. run a piss up in a. Bar. Well, I've had to edit it to take out all the uh, the. Anders ones. Okay, if either of you saw your fullback being ripped apart, would you go and help out your fullback and or scream at the winger or wait for the manager to tell you to go and do something? That's from Abdul Ahad Jaweed. Well, as a defensive midfielder, I'll probably go over, support the midfield, the fullback inside, and rip his ass at the same time that he was getting ripped, and then you know try and help him out. Really, that's all <laughs> you can do in it. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna do anything to to sort of be negative to the team I'll go over I'll, I'll help him out and then I'll depending on who it is obviously if it was someone who was a bit bigger than me I might be nicer but if it was someone who I could bully yeah I'd get on his case and, and comes his, comes I'll... natural Dave doesn't it really if you're playing football you're on the pitch managers on the side you're just going to do yeah. what you've got to do it's natural yeah. and it's a natural thing to do yeah, if you, you fall back it's getting ripped right? to pieces unless you're Theo Walcott yeah no you, I'll go over there I'd help him out I'd do what I could do and then I'd have just say you know it's change this I'll do whatever or maybe I might have to just keep going out in him that's how it is you know okay. you've got to carry the piano you've got to carry the water around for other people that's what you've got to do you've got to help out alright Rory Bain and Gray says if you had to replace one current squad member with yourself who would you replace in the I starting would 11 replace Matthew Flamining and play in there all the time in front of that back four probably till I was about 45 <laughs> and <laughs> Ashley could probably still play then mate uh, no I don't know about that but 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 uh, if they had that role for me, and I came along now, I reckon, you know, with, a, with the sort of training they do, and like I said earlier, yeah. with me and Jimmy, you'd have all that input. We could definitely have an impact on the game, as at least as much as the players that are doing it now. All right, final question. This is a good one. From Anders Bernihal. Um, what was the team reaction when you signed Limpar? Totally different style of player and probably the best player in the team. Did you put him to the test on the training pitch before he was accepted by the team? Well, Hills, you could probably answer that because I, I signed after. Um, well, I wasn't there when Anders signed. It, I, yeah. I, I think he came about a, a year, two years before me. Um, but Anders, for me, was was a fantastic player. He, he was he was one of them players that could excite the fans. Uh, he was he had great ability. Um, unfortunately, I think in the end for for for, for Anders, he didn't quite fit into George George's uh, methods and uh, the style of play. Which is surprising because when he on the ball he was absolutely amazing, but I think George at the time wanted that that structure, and um, he wanted that solid solid forward in the, mid, in, in the middle of the park, and he wanted Anders to track back, which wasn't his game at all. Anders didn't like tracking back and helping his full back, which was all me talking about that. But it was you were there when Anders signed. I mean, he was he was a breath of fresh air, wasn't he, when he signed? Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. I think everyone just respected his ability from from day one on the on the training pitch because he he was so skillful, such quick feet. We didn't really have anyone in the team who could do that, but um, but what I will say is I don't, I don't think there was any 
expectation when Anders came in. No one had heard of that. Don't, don't be funny. I personally hadn't heard of Anders Limpar. It come from Cremonese in Italy. I hadn't heard of after players that George brought, you know, the Paul Leadersons, the Ziggy Johnsons. <laughs> I didn't know where they was coming. Even Ian Wright, yeah, he scored a couple of goals for Crystal Palace in the cup final when he'd Very come on sub after breaking a leg and all of that. But, mate, they weren't all, they weren't like marquee signings. They were players who he knew could do a job. And Anders came in and was, he weren't put to the test on the training field. George knew what he wanted Anders to do. Um, and and Anders had to fit into his system. And like Jimmy said, in the end, he probably he probably worked his way out of the system because he gradually wanted to play his own kind of. He liked doing his own thing. He was, he, you know, he was a he, he was a sort of free spirit at, at times, on and off the pitch, by the way. Um, <laughs> but he, uh, he 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 brought that to the game. We didn't have a free spirit in the team, but you can only accommodate one in George's a free spirit so often in George's side, and so. But Anders was fantastic. I mean, I always got on well with brilliant with Anders. Um, I'm not saying. I mean, me and Jimmy go back like hundreds of years, I think. So you were Portsmouth <laughs> together as well, weren't you? You and Jimmy. Yeah, I've got I've got a thing for wingers. I quite fancy wingers. They're quite. Oh uh, well, it was, it was like that, a male a male uh, fetish for wingers. It, it, I have to say, it was down to me that Ills actually joined Portsmouth because I remember uh, being at Pompey for for about a year. I'd signed from from Arsenal in '95. And I remember we we were coming back on the on the coach and the manager pulled me down the the, the front and he, he sat me down and he went thinking about signing Dave Villiers. What do you think? And I went, I think I think it'd be a fantastic signing. I think it's just what we need. I think you bring bring that that bit of hardiness in the midfield and, and you know get his foot in and and uh, I think he'd do a good job. Two days later he walks into the change room and he hills. So I was like, ah, hills here. He's finally arrived and uh, he got straight into the banter and he was he was accepted straight away. So. Uh, you still, you still never gave me a little, uh, little drink yeah, for that. Yeah, but no, listen, listen. Jimmy's making it sound all sweet there. Let me tell you how it really was. I walked into the dressing room, right, and Jimmy went, "Oh, all right, lads. This is David Ilya. Watch your bags. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your bags and your suitcases. That's that was the opening line." Yeah, but it was, it was. But you, you're not saying you're, you're responsible, which was even better. He said, "Fuck off, Jim." I said, "You got shit. You got you lot got shit bags. I only go for Vic Louis Vuittons." Exactly. I said, <laughs> and, and, it, and it broke the ice straight away. Straight away from day one. You were, you were in, weren't you? Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's how it is, mate. Isn't it? It's all good. Yeah, it's banter, isn't it? It's football banter, isn't it? Isn't it? As Jimmy Bullard would say, banter, mate, banter. Uh, is that it, Dave? Do you want another one, or do you want to go now? Uh, the, uh, you might as well stay now. You might as well stay now. How long we got now? <laughs> Actually, you know? I, I, I want this done in another 10 minutes. All right. 10. Last one, I'm going. I'm All getting right. out early. Right, JV Gooner says, at their peak, do either of you think you would have got into the current Arsenal 11? He says yes. Uh, I'll answer this one, Jim. On my behalf and yours, I'd have definitely played, I'd have definitely played instead of Arteta and <laughs> definitely played in, instead of Flamini. And Jimmy would have just been ripping them up on the wing, mate, because... Although although Walcott's quick and he's got a few skills in that, Jimmy could float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Like uh, listen, it's nice for you to say that. It was. I'm, I'm not. Quite, I'm not so sure. But any, anyhow, um, it's nice would, for you to say. Also. I'd have been picking the team, mate. Hey, if you were You'd picking the team, I'd, I, 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 I'd have been captain if you were picking it. I don't know about captain, mate. I, I don't know right. like them stories about my tracksuit and that. Anyway, I've got to go, yeah? All right, cheers, Dave. Cheers, Dave. Thank you very much. Cheers, Dave. Love you. Bye-bye. Tell them, mate. Top boys. Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy, was you... You know when you was at Millwall, was George in charge at Millwall when you was there? Who was in charge? No, it wasn't George, actually. George, I think, left in 85. I signed for Millwall in 1987. Uh, a fellow called John Doherty with Frank oh, yeah. Pintock as the assistant manager. So March '87, I I was there. George had already been at Arsenal for I think 18 months. 12th of March 1987, 15,000 pound from QPR. Bargain. Hey, you're worth every penny. I was actually so, there the day at Arsenal when you scored two your two goals against Southampton. What do you really? remember about that game? It was a fantastic, a fantastic game. I remember I actually wasn't down to start that game. Ray Parler was, was was supposed to play on the right wing on that on that day, and um, I think he went down with some sort of food bug. Before the game, and I remember George coming up, coming up to me at the uh, golf club. We used to have our pre-matches over in Totteridge before going on to Highbury, and he said uh, you'd be playing on the right. And I think it was probably, you know, the fact that I wasn't that I wasn't, you know, getting G'd up to play for that game. I was fairly relaxed, and and then George came up with, "Are oh, you playing?" I was really, really relaxed going into that game, and um, 
I probably won the, my best games ever in an Arsenal shirt. It was an exciting game. I remember it was backwards and forwards. We scored, then Ned go and score. I think the, the Tizier on that day was on fire. He scored at least, I think, two for his team. Um, I managed to get a couple of goals myself, which is fantastic. And also, um, I hit the bar in, in injury time, which which could have been a hat trick, but um, I settled for the two, and it was a good win for the boys. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you did. You scored in the twentieth. We were three nil up after. Well, they scored first in the fourth minute. Then okay. Lin- Linigan scored fifteen. Merson sixteen. You twenty. And yep. then Mickey Adams and Letizia for them. And then you scored in the seventy ninth minute. And Anders Limpard yep. again come on for that game. He uh, no, he um, pulled a dick off. Come on for Anders Limpard. And Hillier was on the bench. Okay, I remember Hills coming on because um, he come must have been. Davis. A- yeah, he must have been on the pitch. Um, when I when I scored my second goal because I remember we I think Kev Campbell went, was going through, and he got brought down on the edge of the box and Hills to be fair I mean I I was making myself available and he just put his hand on the ball and literally played about two or three yard pass into me, um, and I was able to throw a little sh- few little shapes I think I drifted past the, <laughs> Terry Erlock, um who, who went for the the, 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 the shot and he like give it one of them try to block it and I've gone past him wriggled myself into the box and I've done a little toe poke how it's got past. Tim Flowers. It must have gone past about three or four different bodies and trickled over the line. It weren't a, weren't a fantastic goal, but it literally just about got over the line. But it was one of them that put us um, gave us the three points, which is brilliant. Jimmy, who was the um, who was the most difficult defender that you played against? You come up against in your career? Well, that's that's a really good question because I always uh, around about them sort of times when you when when defenders could tackle. Um, I, I used to come up with, against the, the likes of Julian Dix. Um, who I was actually with at a luncheon today, funny enough, we're good, our good friends with Julian, um, and also Stuart Pierce. them sort of boys uh, were, were out there applying their trade, and they, were, they, they would love to put a little bit on you. As, as defenders, they would want to put you in row Z in the first five minutes. And, and back in them days, you were allowed as well. I mean, you know, you got the first one was free. <laughs> them them yeah. boys would be getting sent off left, right and centre now. They wouldn't, last, they wouldn't last five minutes on the pitch. It was but, almost um, it was almost a given, wasn't it? First oh, five minutes, then, but, uh, you're yeah, up in the air. Through your boots, just got yeah. You got you're allowed one or two, so you know then. But I always, funny enough, I always done quite well against them sort of the, the hatchet men, so to speak, the left backs who always were quite quite tough because you you sort of knew what you were coming up against, and I always used to sort of visualise the night before if I'd play against the likes of Julian or or, or Stuart Pearce, and always knew what was coming. First five, they're going to want to put one on you, and it's like withstanding that one, and then. You know, especially if they got booked the first, like for, in the first half, you knew that you had a little bit of, you know, that you could run at them and they'd, they'd be on tender hooks from that point on. But one player who um, wasn't that well known, to be fair. I mean, but having said that, he, he ended up playing for his country, Republic of Ireland. A fellow called Terry Phelan, who ended up Man City, was at Wimbledon. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I always yeah, I remember. Had, I always had, I always had problems with him because he was a type of player who never dived in, and he'd always make you make a decision in terms of. Go past him. So, and he, and he was this boy was quick. I mean, I, I had a little bit of pace about me, but he, toe feeling was could pack, catch pigeons. And to be fair, you'd knock it by him, and he'd have the cigar out, and he'd be jogging. <laughs> and 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 what was make even more annoying, he'd be talking to you as well. Is that all you got? Is that all you got, Jimmy? Is that all you got? Come on, you can do better than that. So it it get, it'd give you verbals as well. So it was a, one of them Good really an, yeah really annoying players, but one of them players that um, always struggled to get the, the, the better off. Plenty of pace and all the kid, didn't he? He had plenty he, of pace. He had pace to burn, so you feeling for sure, yeah. Do you know one one other question? You know, you had a big move to Liverpool, didn't you? It was a massive move, I think, at the time for you. Yeah. Um, what was it like up there? How did you cope with it? Well, it, it was amazing, really, because, you know, coming through the ranks and whatever, you know, I, I made my league debut um, for Millwall quite late, really, because I was, I was 21, where other players were 17, 18, getting into sides. I had to bide my time because I got, I, I got released from from Palace when I was about 19, went out the game for a little while, was stacking shelves in my mate's off licence, so I was out the game for about a whole year, uh, managed to get go on, get, get on a few trials, and um, finally QPR took me on, and then from there I was playing in the reserves, doing quite well, and then John Doherty brought me from Millwall, went straight into the side at Millwall, and had four, four really good years, we were very successful, and then from that point, you, you know, you always felt, you want, you, as a player, you always want to try and play at, the, at at the very highest level. I think that's that's in any player. Um, and I was no different. And I had four fantastic years at Millwall. Um, and in my last year, there was a lot of um, a lot of talk. In actual fact, there was, there was so much talk. That I, was, I was coming to Highbury. 
Uh, and it was amazing that how I didn't come because I know George was always at the den with Theo Foley um, watching us. And um, it was always common knowledge, even amongst the Arsenal players, that I was going to come to Arsenal. Um, however, it didn't turn out that way. Celtic come in for us. And um, the manager at the time, Bruce Royock, said that um, he wouldn't let me go because um, we were in a relegation dogfight at the time. Um, and I thought that really was my big moves sort of washed away. I weren't going to get oh, one. Yeah. And, um, and then in January 91, I got a, got a shout from got my, my, my agent, Frank McIntosh, to say that uh, Liverpool be been on and they want to sign you. Which was fantastic, and went up to went up to Liverpool, and you know when when the likes of Kenny Dalglish comes calling, I mean the, the the man's an absolute legend and, and a gentleman as well. What a fantastic man he is, you know. And he, and um, I remember signing on the Thursday, um, going straight into the side, Aston Villa away, fifty two thousand people there. Um, walk my first day walking into into Anfield because we used to get changed at Anfield at the time, getting a beaten up beaten up old bus and go to Melwood and train. Um, now the boys go straight to the training, but we used to get trained at change at Anfield. First day walking into walking into Anfield, I'm, I'm getting getting give me kit on. I've got Jan Moby to one side, I've got Ian Rush, Peter Beardsley, John Barnes, Steve McMahon, Ronnie Whelan, Ian uh, Alan Hansen. Um, oh, I mean, these are these are guys champions. That, yeah, I mean these are guys that you've been you know you watch on match of day as a little kid, and all of a sudden you're getting changed amongst these boys, and um, it was one of the moments where you think. Do you know what? This is this, this is unbelievable, isn't it? And you, you're sort of pinching yourself, but at the same time, in a quite a weird way, you've also known that you've you've earned the right to be there. Um, but that was brilliant. But unfortunately for me, like I say, went went straight into the side on on the Saturday at Villa. And what was re- really quite special was that before the game, Kenny Dalglish came up to me and handed me the number seven shirt, which was which was wow. amazing, really. Which was like it's one of them where you think, oh my God, does it get any better than this? But unfortunately for me, Kenny went. And and I have to say, my whole my whole life and my whole career, probably I probably never recovered from that actually in in, in football in terms, you know, because that was you know you, you build yourself up to that one moment you finally arrive where you think well this is you know the, the one of the greatest players that ever played the game has called you and, and wanted you to play for for his team, and then he resigns four weeks later and for me when Sooners took over I mean my confidence by that time was was gone and I don't really think I ever recovered from that even when I come to Arsenal and and really it shouldn't have been that way you sh- I should have got that another little lift but I, I I never really recovered from that and um, it's a shame really but I suppose looking back to have represented two of the biggest clubs in the world in in Arsenal and Liverpool and especially Arsenal growing up as a a Lislington boy you know I suppose that will always be that's a dream from- mate. One from, my, one from my kids to look on and, and think, yeah, my, my dad or, you know, my dad wants to play for the, for, the, for the Mighty Reds, you know. Fantastic. you got time for a few more questions, Jim? Absolutely. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, there was one that I was uh, looking at here from Nicola, where it ends in a J, and I'm not going to pa- attempt to pronounce his surname. He said, if you could pick one of your former teammates to put into the current Arsenal team to help fix mm. their problems, who would that be and why? I'd probably say Teddy Sheringham. Um, Teddy was a fantastic player. Very, I mean, I'd say underrated. I mean, he went on to play for England. He's now an MBE. Very, very close friend of mine. We, we, we played for the same Sunday side when we were 13 years old. He went to Millwall. I went to Palace as a kid. Um, for me, Teddy was one of them players, is, is one of them players that he's got great ability. Never had any pace, Teddy, but he was always five steps ahead up, upstairs in, in his brain. What a fantastic player. He, and even when he weren't playing well, he was one of them players. That he, he was a leader. And he'd bring other players into the game. He was great at holding the ball up. And I just think, if, 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 if Teddy was up front for Arsenal right now, obviously it's, it's hypothetical and he's obviously retired now, but you know, you could, I could just see him in there because he could, he'd be a great link-up player. You know, you, he had a great brain on him, Teddy. And he, could, he could play in any top side. You know, you give him the ball, you know where to put it. And also, if you're having a bad game, I remember many times at Millwall when I was, I was having a stinker, it, it, it pulled me out and, and like, gave me a right rollicking. He was a winner. Teddy's a winner. And for me, he was one of them. He's a player. When that question came up just now, I think Teddy... Um, I mean, we, hang on a sec. We're talking experts as well, by the way. We probably won't go and sit down too well. But, I mean, I, I just, I just think... Te- yeah, but he's, he is a top... Teddy was a top, top player and, and, and went on to big things. You know, Manchester United, um, MBE. You know, he, he, he's a fantastic fella. Ah, sorry, good. How much did, time did you spend on loan at Oxford? Because that's where Gimli's from. Hey. Well, I, I had two spells at Oxford. Um, I'm not quite sure in the actual months or years I was there, but I, th- I think I spent one month and then the following season went on for another month's loan. 
first one was was quite successful. I really enjoyed my time there. Second one, I was injured when I went up there. Because they were in Division and, One at the time, which is like the Championship now. Uh, oh no, were, yeah. they, were they in the the Premier League? No, uh, they, no weren't, they, they weren't. No, 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 no. They won one below, I think. Yeah, or Division which, which, Two. Which yeah. Be, yeah, which would be the Championship now. I think. The old Division One Championship. Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, but the manager again had great confidence. He just said, "Listen, you know, you." you Great that you're here. He couldn't, he couldn't believe that it, Arsenal let me go on loan, but he was fantastic. De- uh, Dennis Smith, it was, and uh, Malcolm Crosby, who ended up managing Sunderland for a little while. Uh, yeah, because they got big ties with our, um, Oxford as uh, Jim Smith, wasn't he? Um, around yeah. a couple of years ago, he was chairman or something like that. I remember. Right, right, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, it was Dennis Smith actually, not not Jim. Jim Smith was a Mar- derby manager, wasn't he? Oh, yes, and that's the one I'm yeah. thinking yeah. of. Birmingham. Yeah. Yeah, Dennis Smith was at Stoke. Uh, I think as a player, I'm not quite sure where else he managed. But yeah, he, big centre half, wasn't he, Dennis Smith? Big, big, big centre half. Highlights, big, highlights his hair. Big, honest, tough centre half, and um, yeah, um, I enjoyed my, my my time at Oxford. The fans were, were great, and um, yeah, I was up and down the M25 and up the M, M40, and it was it was it was good. It was a good time. I enjoyed my time there. Good, right. Jordan um, Cini says thoughts on why the current team isn't successful. God, that's a tough one. Good luck. It is a tough one, isn't it? I mean, I think a lot of it is probably down to the resources. I mean, you look at the likes of Chelsea and Man City, got money coming out of their ears, haven't they? I mean, you've got the, the Abramovich money. They literally, you know, in terms of salaries, in terms of um, how they can compete in the marketplace, they're, they're, they're buying the best players. They're able to attract the best players. I mean, we have got, recently we splashed out big. Obviously, as we know, we've got Ozil, we've got Alexis, which, who's been absolutely on fire. But I just think it's that another little... Um, another little bit of input financially that we need to maybe just take us to that next level. Um, perhaps we, we we need to shore up at, at the back a little bit and make us more. I'd, I'd like to see us more resilient at the back and not give be so. so going, going forward, we're, we're we're great at times, and and we've got so much talent and ability in, in the midfield and going forward. But going back to the George Graham, you know, years, he he would not have tolerated losing two, three, four goals in the game. He would just like if we went one or two up, we'd just close it off. You know, I mean, you look at the back four. It's the famous back four, isn't it? You know, Boldy, Tony Adams, Nigel Lee. You know, we're, we're not quite there, are we? We've got Gibbs, so I think he's a very good player. Koscielny, when he comes in, he's on fire. He's, he's on top form. Murtasaka, I, I think the jury's still out there. Right back, Debussy's look good. But I don't know. We just, just need that a little bit more resilience, I think. More more steel. A um, bit more toughness in the middle of the park as well, I think, as well. We, we need that. Um, if we can get that... Um, I think we'll be out of challenge, without a doubt. OK, one final one. This is from me. What was your, your fondest memories of playing for Arsenal? Um, I think uh, what most memorable was obviously the day I signed. I remember, like I say, going into Ken Fryer's office, signing my contract, Ken put it in a... Mr Fryer put it in a, the contract in an A4 envelope, brown envelope. And I remember walking home because my, my dad lived around the corner. And I remember Frank saying to me, because Frank lived in Winchmore Hill, I lived in... Hertfordshire and he went I'll give you a lift home I went down no, no. so I walked walked to my dad's I walked to my dad's rung on the bell and um, went up to his flat and he went what are you doing here he thought you up in Liverpool and I, I said I've just signed for Arsenal that, wow. was, that was a proud moment for me do you know what I mean just turn up there and, and just throw the contracts on the table just I've just signed for Arsenal it was it was an emotional day for him you know which was brilliant which was great and uh, I suppose on the field was probably the two goals um, as we spoke about already when I uh, scored two when we beat for, um, Southampton 4-3 and obviously being involved with the famous cup runs of '93 when we both we won both cups um, against Sheffield Wednesday. One went to a replay, didn't it? And then we went. Obviously, although I didn't play in any of the finals, you know, even being a part of that squad, it was it was great times. It was great times. And going to Copenhagen was another fantastic night. Smudger put the ball in the back of net. We won one nil yeah. against all the odds as well because no one fancied us. Palmer were. It was literally how many they're going they were going to win by. And we've we put you know the likes of uh, Paul Davis out there, Steve Moore, Ian Selly was 18, 19 years old, and no one fancies one little bit, but that's the Arsenal spirit. We went there, we had a game plan, frustrated them, and we come away victorious. So, some great memories, some fantastic memories for Arsenal. Do you, want to, really tell, do you want to tell people what you're up to now, just and how they can follow you on Twitter? Uh, I've, just, I've just gone on Twitter. Uh, I ain't got many followers, to be fair. I've got I about 300, which is which is nothing, compared to Dave's, I don't know, 10,000 or something, Dave Villiers. Really but yeah, and I'm, I'm Jimmy Carter seven seven seven. Um, but no, I'm, I'm involved in property. Um, I, I've always always built houses and construct been in construction. Even when I was playing for Arsenal, I'd, 
I weren't a golfer, weren't a, weren't a, a big drinker, and I, I never, you know, weren't a gambler and all that. So, you know, back then we had so much time on our hands. I'd go straight from training ground and, and project manage building sites, knowing that in in the future that come 35 or whatever it was when I finished playing football, I'd have to do something, something else because as we spoke about before, you know, the, the, the big salaries weren't about back then. Um, I do some media work for Arsenal, which is fantastic. I do the co-commentaries and live shows for Arsenal Player. So um, anyone tuning in to them shows will we'll see the likes of me, Dave Villier, Stephen Hughes, Nigel, Martin Hayes. Still play for the Masters, for Arsenal, Arsenal Masters, and also Liverpool when they give me a shout. Um, but yeah, um, just um, just spinning plates really, to be fair. Just, it's nice to have that little bit of... Um, um, you know, d- different sort of things that I, I wake up in the morning, not quite sure what the day's going to hold, which is which is nice. Having that variety is nice at the moment for me. Oh, no, definitely good. so. Um, would you stay with us for just two more minutes and just give us a prediction on the Newcastle game as our guest this week? Absolutely, yeah. Of course. Oh, you're you're a gentleman. And if you wanted to stay another minute longer, we also do shout outs. So anyone that you wanted to give a shout out on Twitter or just that you know. Um, you can stay for that as well. But we will do predictions first. And Danny, I'm going to start with you. Newcastle at home is the game. So hit me. Oh, dear. Kickoffs at 5.30. So I should just be dragging my ass out of bed for that. Um, I've read that we've got no defenders left. So oh, it's, going to, it's, it's going to be a schlobber knocker. It's either going to be a 4-4 or a 0-0. So I'm going to go 2-2, meet him in the middle. And first okay. goal scorer, I might as well pick Podolsky. Why not? You never know, he might come on and school then actually no if it's 2-2 it won't be Podolsky will it it's going to be Giroud ok Jeff for a comfortable 3-1 I think I honestly do think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go past Newcastle quite quite easy might even go 3-0 up or something um, first goal scorer I've got to go for Alexis really he's, you know, okay. he's, in, he's, he's in the money isn't he uh, Jimmy well it's a tough one this one because obviously Newcastle started so poorly this season but they've gone on a fantastic run you got to say, I mean, the confidence is sky high. It's going to be a tough game. Um, I'm going to go, going to go for an Arsenal victory off the back of the fantastic performance in midweek uh, against Galatasaray. I think the confidence will be sky high. I think the boys that have been rested, the likes of Alexis and other guys, are going to come back fresh, going to come into the side. So I'm going to go for an Arsenal win. I'm going to go for a 2-1 win for Arsenal. OK, fantastic. Uh, who's your, going to be your first scorer? Alexis. Alexis. Okay, that's um, shot me out the water because I've got written in front of big 2 1 Alexis, the, <laughs> my own prediction. So, okay, um, so I'm going to go 3 1 Alexis and uh, we'll move on to some shout outs now. I'll go first this week. Um, as some of the pod boys know, um, it was my other half, Kate's birthday this week. I won't tell you how old, 20 again. Um, so go follow her. Um, She's at Guna Girl Kate. Um, she, you'll hear her on this podcast um, every now and then. So, uh, her happy birthday for in the week, and um, lots of love to you, my darling, uh, Danny. Yes. Oh, your shout out, I'd, please. I'm I'm single and sad. Is uh, my cats? Like I say, like my cats. Uh, you know, you showed you showed a picture of a cat on your bed the other day. Like I said, that's the first thing. That's the first pussy that's been there for a few years. <laughs> You know, sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> I know. Um, you remember Colin, the spider catcher, next door? Yes. He lived there 20 years. He, look, he looks like the kind of man who would uh, sexually abuse a donkey and wouldn't think twice about it. He's actually in hospital. He was in an induced coma because he's a dirty bastard. He's one of them stinky smokers and he won't stop. So both of his lungs collapsed and he's uh, yeah, he's in an induced coma for two days. So I've told him, told his son to tell him, get the fuck up. I think I've seen a spider. <laughs> so luckily he's out of his induced coma. He's breathing and he's talking and he should be back home soon. But I've missed him because he's a, he's a big fat tattooed he looks like a 65 year old Chris Carpenter that's let himself go <laughs> so did, did the spider story drag him from his coma then it's, he smiled but he still thinks it's Sunday because he's been in the coma for two and a half days so I'm going to go down and see him in the next few days and cheer him right up <laughs> better take someone with you then but Colin, you're normally at... Colin doesn't do technology so he's not on Twitter okay fair enough um, Jimmy yeah um I don't know. I've I've only just gone on, haven't I? So um, 
I suppose I better shout myself out. I bet you've already done that, in you? But um, <laughs> do it what... again. Do it again. We are a show uh, that has no uh, rules. Fuck it. What, what it is again. your Twitter? What is your Twitter it's handle, Jimmy? G- G- Jimmy Carter seven seven seven. Nice. That's Jimmy Carter seven seven seven. You can't really get it wrong. So if you're listening to this, make sure you've got your phone in your hand as you're listening, and you'll go into Twitter right now. Jimmy Carter seven seven seven. Follow him. Well, do doing, it. Doing this podcast, uh, he's had an extra seventeen followers. I bet you we can get out. I bet we bet we can get out another two hundred by the time. But this time tomorrow <laughs> night. Tell you what, if, if Jeff tweets it and Jeff um, makes it so, you, you could have you at a grand by the weekend if he tells people <laughs> he's leaving unless they follow you. <laughs> let's, let's let's make that our goal. Let's have Jimmy to a thousand by Hashtag, Saturday night. Hashtag Jimmy to a thousand. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Brilliant. Shot. <laughs> nice, nice one, boys. Nice yeah. one. Great. Happy Let's good. do it. Lovely job. Right. And finally, Jeff. Oh, yeah, I've got a shout out. Not a Twitter shout out, though. Um, a shout out for the manager, Arsene Wenger. It took a lot of stick last week, last uh, last weekend at Stoke. I reckon, and there's, apparently there's a, a, a Wenger out protest. Believe it or not. Uh, at a game at Newcastle at the weekend at the, at the Tony Adams statue I hope nobody turns up for it but everyone's entitled to their opinion but we should get behind the manager inside the stadium and start singing his name again and get by, but get behind the team so my shout out is to, to the great man Arsene Wenger cool. I'm glad I had a bucket on hand I joke of course <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all that's left is to thank our wonderful guests um tonight dave was of course gone but jimmy thank you so much it's it's been an absolute pleasure uh, it's been brilliant i really enjoyed it guys and uh anytime you want us back on just give us a shout not, oh, not a problem Lovely. Right G- jim i'll tell you what you've been absolutely fantastic yes. mate a gentleman fantastic yeah. thank, thank you so much it's been a pleasure it really has so, so far you. our our um abw11 has got two pros in it now if we ever decide to go and take on any teams i'm in goal <laughs> Jeff, Jeff's up front, Davies is centre back, and then you two can come and play in, in an eleven. <laughs> I'm 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 in midfield with uh, Hillier. Are you? Uh, yeah, I'll and, take that. And you'll stand behind him for ninety minutes, going, "Yeah, yeah, you yeah. want some?" And then I'll I'm, go, I'm... go, you go deal with that, Dave. <laughs> I got to do my hair. You know, you ain't got any ginger hair. I have. No, shut ah, up. Ah, see, you didn't said you had. Oh, I knew. I've just, right. I've just tweeted hashtag Jimmy to a thousand. There you go. That's our new hashtag for tonight <laughs> to get um, tonight's guest, the next Arsenal player, Jimmy Carter, to a thousand followers. So do it now. <laughs> so that was a Burkamp Wonderland podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and keep it Arsenal. Good night. Merry Christmas, cheeky monkeys. It's not Christmas yet. Oh, fuck off.